Hello, I'm Bewildebeast, and this is Majora's Mask Glitchless 100%. The definition of 100% in Majora's Mask is obtaining all the things that Link does not lose upon playing Song of Time to reset a cycle. That includes all the main items, all of the masks, the upgrades, sword, wallet, bomb bag, and quiver, the fairy fountain rewards, overworld maps, dungeon maps and compasses, and of course heart pieces. This will be glitchless, meaning some of the things you may have seen before in Majora's Mask speedruns will not be a part of this speedrun. We won't be getting infinite sword glitch. We will not be doing any bomb hovers, hesses, super slides, etc. We won't be clipping out of bounds. Uh, we won't be doing a variety of other things. There are so many glitches in this game. But some interesting and challenging movement techniques will be done throughout the run. This speedrun is far from just playing the game through the intended way through some clever routing and just tight gameplay, it's possible to do things in an unintended order and make it a bit speedier. As a side note, this is not my PB even at the time of recording. My PB right now is a 5 hour, 58 minute, and 36 second run, and this run lasts 6 hours and 36 seconds. The reason I'm not recording this on my PB is I recorded my mic audio on top of the game audio and it wouldn't really work for commentary. But gameplay quality wise, this run is pretty similar to my PB. I do lose an unfortunate amount of time to an RNG based minigame near the end, but um, it should be a good demonstration. This game has a lot of intro, but it gives me time to talk about what we're about to see. Uh, we're going to see some cool movement stuff in the very first time I gain control of Link, which is uh, 30 seconds or so from now. First thing to talk about is that as human, without any glitches, back walking is the fastest form of movement. So whenever I'm human, I'm going to be back walking as much as I can if I'm you know, moving in a straight line and I have a clear uh, line of sight to my destination. If I need to be moving around corners, anything, I'm probably going to be rolling, which is faster than walking, and I will try to walk as little as possible. This movement is going to begin with what's called a quick turnaround which will be targeting, quickly untargeting, and then retargeting so that I can flip the camera 180 degrees as I just did without having to wait for it to pan all the way around. One other interesting thing here is that I'm going for a pop-up here. That looked a little weird. Pop-ups are defined differently from clips in Glitchless 100%. Clips are banned, pop-ups are allowed, and pop-ups are, as far as I can tell, kind of a case-by-case -case thing. Um, there are a few others of those in the run that I'll point out, but it's basically Link is approaching a ledge and the game decides, even though he doesn't look like he's really going to make it, sure, he'll make it. That's one of those. While we have this intro time, back to some movement talk. Um, I mentioned that backwalking is very fast as human, however, once we get Goron Mask, that's going to... Well, it, we're not going to get rid of backwalking, there's still going to be plenty of backwalking in the run, but rolling as Goron is just so much more, uh, so much faster than backwalking that we'll be using that as much as possible. For reference, anyone familiar with the game will have seen the bunny hood, which makes Link walk very fast. Backwalking is the same speed as Bunnyhood, and conveniently we can do it from the very beginning of the game.
As with all Majora's Mask speedruns, the first 20-30 minutes or so of this run will not be quite as interesting as the rest of it is. This game has a whole lot of intro. There will still be some things to talk about though. Uh, for example, mashing through text, I've been doing this whole time, we'll be doing for the remainder of the run. Um, the goal in mashing through text is to never see a, uh, a blue triangle at the bottom of the text box. If you're mashing frame perfectly, that won't happen. And I do my best to... Oh, messed up my back walk there. I do my best to, um, but sometimes fail. You can be mashing B and A and C up for text. However, I don't mash C up anymore as it occasionally has some issues. Uh, you can accidentally hit one of the other C buttons. Uh, since I'm playing this on Wii C, that's with a GameCube. C stick, and it's very accident, very easy to accidentally hit C right or C left, and use an item, and that can have some pretty bad effects. So here, usually you just see someone go into the first flower, but it's actually a little bit faster to take this second flower, just because we don't have to see Deku Link falling at the end of the flight. And then here, I'm going to skip some tattle text. Tattle normally would alert you to the presence of the Deku Butler's son over there, but with a carefully placed side hop, I can make it into this flower without activating that text. And this is where it becomes obvious that this is a glitchless run. There is a cutscene skip here called Happy Mask Salesman Cutscene Skip, where you pause buffer, well if you pause buffer frame by frame, then the game never has two frames in a row to activate this cutscene. And we're not doing that, because this is glitchless. We get to see all the cutscene action. Alright, now we've finally made it out to Clock Town, where we can begin playing the game. And my first course of action will be to immediately reset. There's a console reset here on the English version of the game. I'll talk about why I'm running on English in a minute. Uh, on the English version of the game, it's a little bit faster to reset the console here because the game has auto-saved upon entering Clock Town, and normally you'd have a lot of tattle text to advance through. This is about two seconds faster. So the goal here in this first cycle of the game is to get the ocarina back, and the way to do that, at least glitchlessly, is to get to the end of the three-day cycle and uh, then go into the clock tower and um, take the ocarina from Skull Kid. To do that, we just want to advance time, in-game time, that is, as quickly as possible. So we're going to get into the inn, whoops, going to get into the inn and use Grandma downstairs to advance to day three immediately. And now we're going to go to uh, West Clock Town and use the Scarecrow to advance to nighttime. And that will be as close as we can get using in-game time skips uh, to the 
midnight on the final day, which will allow us to get into the clock tower. Now that it is night of the final day, 6 p.m., we have six in-game hours to wait before we can access the clock tower, so we're going to use that time to do a few things. First, we're going to go collect the clock town stray fairy, and that'll allow us to go get magic from the fairy fountain. We're going to use that then to pop the balloon and go collect the bomber kids so that we can get the bomber code which we'll use later to get the Bomber's Notebook. And then we're also going to get some rupees to buy the bomb bag, which will be extremely useful after this cycle when we're transformed back into human. One thing to note here is that the stuff that we're doing, those three main things I mentioned, getting magic, getting the bomb bag, and getting the bomber code, don't really take all that much in-game time. So we, we have a surplus of it and movement and you know, basic optimizations like that don't really matter all that much in this you know, five, 10 minute section of the run, which is a little bit weird but kind of convenient, gives you time to write down the bomber code when you get it, and makes it possible to uh, optimize in other ways. Like I said, we're trying to advance in-game time as quickly as possible, meaning we want to avoid going through extra loading zones and talking to NPCs more than we need to, because all of that uh, will pause in-game time. So you'll see me spinning around as Deku, which is equivalent to rolling as human. Um, well, a little faster. Anyway, it's kind of like rolling as human. And I'll stop spinning when I'm near an NPC just to make sure I don't talk to them because in-game time is more important than real time at this point. Now I mentioned before that I'm getting the bomber code here so that I can get the bomber's notebook later. Normally what you'd have to do here, or casually what you would do here, is you would defeat, or well, play hide and seek with the bombers, find all of them, get their code, go into the uh, bomber's hideout, make your way to the astral observatory underground, get the moon's tier, come back, and then use the moon's tier to get up to the clock tower, uh, that high ledge. We're not going to do that, we're going to skip all of that with a gainer, which I'll explain in a little bit. And the reason that it's worth skipping all of that is that that would take a lot of uh, pausing in-game time, going through different loading zones, talking to different NPCs, looking through the uh, telescope, all that stuff. Also, it's just a lot to do. You'll notice here that I don't talk to the bomb salesman, I guess is his title, until he gets all the way to the counter to avoid having to wait in that cutscene and uh, allowing me to pass more in-game time. A 
Oh, will the code be one, two, three, four, five? No. Oh, well. Optimally, a code would have the one at the end so that when we're entering the code, we don't have to pan all the way over to that text box. Uh, by the way, I, j I just stood there for a moment as I was writing the code down. Um, but that's okay. That's a very minor time loss. And here is our gainer to get up here without using the moon's tier. A gainer is an important piece of glitchless tech that allows us to grab onto ledges that we normally would not be able to grab onto. Uh, I have in-game time to kill here, there's just nothing to do here, so I'm practicing my gainers. And what's going on here is I'm doing a backflip, uh, which involves targeting and pressing back and A. During the backflip, immediately untargeting, and then targeting again. That's uh, a frame perfect, untarget and retarget. And what targeting a wall in this game does is not just align Link with the wall, but give him forwards momentum into the wall. So targeting a wall, or rather targeting during a backflip from a wall, very early in the backflip, means that Link is still close enough to the wall that the game registers him as targeting the wall. So it gives him forward momentum at the height of the backflip, which allows him to grab onto the ledge. The gainer will be used several more times in the run. And there we go. Ooh, this is the part where we get to watch a cutscene of a nose. A large and intimidating one. Look at that nose. Alright, finally we have our ocarina back, and this will set forth the chain of cutscenes and events that allows us to transform back into human and really get started in 100%ing the game. But again, we do have some cutscenes to get through. It is worth mentioning at this point, because I think I, I mess up songs several times in the run, that there's kind of an art to playing songs on the ocarina in this game. In most cases, when you pull out the ocarina in the game, you cannot immediately start inputting notes and successfully play the song. However, you can hear the notes you play immediately. There's just kind of a delay before the game starts really registering them. So every time I pull out the ocarina, I will pause uh, for a moment before beginning to play the song, unless I'm in front of a gossip stone or on a prompt like this one. That was a good one, that was a good one. Um, and occasionally, the game will seem to simply not register a note that you play, making it look like you uh, forgot a note in the song. And occasionally I do forget notes in the song. It happens. But most of the time, it's not that. It's just the game not registering notes. And I'm probably just not holding down the notes as long as I should be, but I want to go fast. So... We'll probably see some of that later. It's a common problem. So now that we've got the ocarina back, we'll finish the first cycle by playing the Song of Time, bringing us back to dawn of the first day. And just like I did when I entered Clock Town a bit ago, I'm going to reset the console as soon as I press yes on saving and returning to dawn of the first day. That saves me a little bit of time over watching the ensuing cutscene. That's just on the first cycle reset though. Other times in the run that I reset the cycle, I am not going to, do, uh, to reset the console. 
Speaking of cycles, this run, even though it's six hours long-ish, is going to only take four in-game cycles. We've just completed the first one, so you might think this run's going to be very short, but no, it is six hours. This uh, second cycle that we just entered is going to last for over three hours of the run. We have a lot to do this cycle. Even just in the first day of this cycle, we have a lot to do. In fact, you may have seen that I played the song of inverted time before re-entering the clock tower. That is to make time move, uh, in-game time move more slowly, so that I have time to complete Deku Palace, Woodfall Temple 1, uh, a lot of Snowhead stuff, Snowhead Temple in its entirety, and some more Snowhead stuff, and Keg Trial, before getting to Epona, which I need to do by 6pm on the first day. In total, in this second cycle, we're going to complete three dungeons and do a lot of overworld stuff. The third cycle we do is going to contain some overworld stuff and Stone Tower Temple, but it's a pretty short one. And then the fourth one is just going to be cleanup, minigames, and the moon. We have now received the Deku Mask, the first of the 24 masks we're going to be getting this run. <laughs> and now we get a little more cutscene action. As mentioned before, the beginning of this game has a lot of intro sequences, and this is the last, well no, this is the second to last long cutscene for a while. But we do get a little bit more gameplay before the second one. Oh, I think now would be a good time to mention, again, I'm playing on the English version of the game, and the reason I think to mention that is that the English version of the game has one text box halfway through this cutscene, it's coming up right here, that Japanese doesn't, and if you're playing on Japanese and then switch over to English for some different category, you'll usually forget to advance this text box. But uh, the reason that this run is on English when so many other Majora's Mask runs are on Japanese is kind of a weird and obscure one. When we're completing the Oceanside Spider House, we're going to be guessing a mask code using arrows. I'll point this out when we get there. And because we're guessing the mask code, it's easy to accidentally run out of arrows if we get bad RNG or are, you know, guessing poorly. And on English, there is a guaranteed arrow drop there allowing you to continue a run. On Japanese, there is not, meaning that a run could potentially die there. There are some other differences, you know, there are plenty of version differences, but that one makes the most impact for this category. Alright, let's get going. First thing to do is to activate the owl, well, first thing to do is advance this text. Then activate the owl statue in Clocktown, I'm gonna be using that one quite a bit. And then we will head over to collect the fairy, the stray fairy from the laundry pool, the same one we collected earlier in first cycle. But when we bring that fairy back to the fairy fountain as human, we will receive the great fairy mask, which will be very useful in collecting all the dungeon fairies. Here I'm going to line up a backwalk. And one kind of strange thing here is that I'm going to get this fairy right now, but I'm, at, I'm not actually going to go get the Great Fairy Mask yet. I'm going to do that a little bit later, where going to North Clocktown and entering the Fairy Fountain will be a little more optimal. Right now I'm on the south side of Clocktown, and there's no other reason to go all the way there. In a moment, I'm going to put on the Deku Mask for the first time, and we're going to see a few second animation of Link uh, screaming in agony, as you might if you were turned into a plant. That cutscene plays the first time you put on a new transformation mask as Link. Uh, oh, more on this in a moment. Do we get bombs? Oh no. 
We're gonna be hunting for bombs here. Uh, they're not strictly necessary, but they do save a lot of time to get them here, so we're gonna check at least these two. There we go. Bush patches, and then enter this cutscene. Uh, I was saying that transformation mask animation happens the first time you put on a new transformation mask as human. If I put on later the Goron mask or the De uh, Zora mask as human, we'd get that cutscene again, but with the other mask. However, if you put on a new transformation mask as a different transformation, for example, if I put on the Goron mask for the first time as Deku, then that cutscene can be skipped. So I'm going to be doing that later on in the run. As an interesting aside here, in a moment we're going to see a shot of the Skull Kid stealing Majora's Mask from the Happy Mask Salesman, and in this cutscene there isn't really a separate bag and mask salesman, but in fact two full mask salesmen. Salesmen? What am I saying? Uh, so we can actually see the ear of the left one on the ground next to the bag. Meant to be hidden underground, but uh, didn't do the greatest job with that. Okay, long cutscenes over for now. Let us begin. Again. As noted before, I'll be back walking whenever possible but spinning in the meantime, as that is faster than walking. Our object in Southern Swamp right now is going to be to get a bottle, well, to activate the Owl Statue, to get a bottle, and to get the Picto Box. Unfortunately, because this is 100% and we need to get the Picto Box, we don't get to do a cool trick that Glitchless Any% percent gets to do called Big Octo Skip here, where as Deku can kind of manipulate the Big Octo that's blocking us from Deku Palace uh, into letting us through without actually killing it. However, later in the run, uh, I want to say an hour and a half in or so, maybe a little closer to two hours, we will do a different version of Big, o Big Octo Skip, which is also very cool. So, delayed gratification there. Was a mystery, casually, you would follow this monkey around so that you know which direction to go to not be reset to the beginning. But the pattern is actually the same all the time. Well, actually, for each in-game day, day one, two, and three, there is a different pattern, or a different pathway here. But day one is always the same, day two is always the same, and day three is always the same. So can just memorize that and go through without the monkey. to talk to witches sometimes. Actually, it, it can be really tough to talk to the one in the woods, to talk to Kume. I do my best. One side note here, in this little section of movement to the back to the witch in the woods, it is slightly faster to go as human than to go as Deku. However, 
it can be important to farm rupees here, and as human you wouldn't end up actually breaking any of the bushes. The time difference is so minimal that I consider it worthwhile to try to farm more rupees here, though it looks like I didn't get very much this time around. Now we've gotten our bottle, and actually we've not just gotten the bottle, but set up for something... Well, we've set up for getting the Picto Box, but also for Witch Archery, which will occur like four hours into the run, for which it is necessary to save Kume. That's kind of an explanation in itself of why this second cycle is so long, the second cycle being over three hours long. Um, there are so many things that... You, you have to do in this game to prepare for other things in game like saving Kume to do witch archery, side quests like Anju Cafe, and things like that, um, or collecting all, all the fairies in the dungeon, where there's not just a lot of stuff to do, there's a lot of stuff to do afterwards too. And if we reset the cycle, we would not be able to do all that stuff. We do have a bit of a boat ride here, uh, where I'm going to be looking at this beautiful scenery, the boat itself, to reduce lag. And coming up after this is the first trick-heavy section of the run. We're entering Deku Palace, a kind of mini dungeon, where the object is to get the Sonata of Awakening, so that we can then enter Woodfall uh, Temple. and. The Deku Palace is normally meant to be done, or casually meant to be done, in a very different way from how we're going to do it. Casually, one is supposed to enter one side, uh, get the magic beans, leave, use a magic bean to get up to the top of the palace, and then cross the top, dodging all of the enemies. We're not quite going to do that. First things first, as human we're going to skip these Deku guards. That can be done with a simple backflip from on top of the fence right next to them. I'm just going to jump over here, get on the fence, and backflip. Next, we're going to use a bomb damage boost, which I'll explain in a little bit, to get on top of this fence. And do some parkour, get over here as human, and we'll jump all the way to the heart piece. Very quick. Next, uh, I try to collect these blue rupees if I can, but RNG doesn't really always call for it. We'll bomb boost back over here to avoid having to go around, backflip onto the store frame, a little bit more parkour, and finally we will actually use the Deku Mask to get from here to the final flower. From here we're going to do another pop-up like I mentioned in the very beginning of the run. Even though Link didn't quite make it to that ledge visibly, he did actually make it. And here we are getting Sonata. Okay, to talk a little bit more about bomb boosts, because uh, the first time I saw a glitchless run, I saw a bomb boost and thought, hey, that's a bomb thing. Those are banned. That's a glitch. And this is the one bomb thing, well, yeah, this is the one bomb thing I can think of anyway that isn't banned. Because it's not a Hess, it's not ISG, it's not an unintended mechanic. What's happening is we're pulling a bomb and then doing a back or dropping the bomb and doing a backflip so that the bomb hits us when we're midair. And when Link gets hit, hit midair in the game, he is supposed to have some recoil back from the source of the damage in the opposite direction. And that's exactly what's happening. He's taking that damage midair, getting thrown back, and because we're midair, we're high enough to get onto a ledge that is either not climbable or we normally wouldn't be able to get to otherwise. So by that combination of intended mechanics, we are doing sequence breaks, or we are going to do more sequence breaks with uh, bomb boosts, and that is considered glitchless.
Alright, now that we have Sonata, it is time to go and enter Woodfall Temple, our first main dungeon. First, we do need to get Song of Soaring, but on the way to Song of Soaring, we'll see yet another pop-up onto this ledge over here. Casually, you would have to go all the way around and use some Deku Flowers and deal with some Dragonflies to get over here, but using these lily pads and a human jump, it is a bit quicker. Will I miss this one up? Oh my. <laughs> the crazy thing about this one is, because I'm playing on WavyC with a GameCube controller, all I have to do for that song is roll my C-stick from the bottom to the top along the left side and somehow I managed to miss the left input. I don't know. There are several things to do in Woodfall here. We'll do most of them after we've completed the dungeon, quite a bit later in the run. For now, we're just going to enter the dungeon as quickly as possible. And to do that, we're actually not going to kill these enemies, these hip loops, but rather just stun them and walk by them. It's a bit faster, and it's unnecessary to kill them. The Deku Scrubs, however, must die. You notice here that I drop down from my flight basically as soon as possible. Flying deck or flying as Deku is a bit slower than just walking on the ground. Here we'll get some supplies, Deku nets and Deku sticks before we play Sonata and enter the dungeon. Funny thing about Deku nets in this run is that they're actually never very useful. There's one trick backup coming up where if you get some weird RNG, Deku nets can be really useful. But aside from that, there isn't really a use for them in the run, and if we didn't get them here, it would be easy to accidentally forget them, and not 100% the game for simply forgetting uh, Deku Nuts, which I find funny. I will not find it funny if I ever uh, have a, an invalid run by finishing without Deku Nuts, but it's unlikely. Okay. This seems a bit counterintuitive, but we're going to split this dungeon, Woodfall Temple, into two different sections. We're going to do part of it now, and then we're going to do part of it quite a bit later in the run, as I mentioned before. And there are a few reasons... Oh my. Uh, there are a few reasons for that. Number one foremost is that when completing the first dungeon in the game, whether, you know, regardless of which dungeon it is, the first dungeon you complete, you will receive Oath to Order, which is the song that will allow us to call the giants at the end and get onto the moon. And when receiving Oath to Order from Woodfall Temple, there is a lengthy cutscene of Tattle talking to Link that follows the giant cutscene. But when receiving Oath to Order from a different dungeon, there is not. There is no additional cutscene. So that's a pretty compelling reason to finish a different dungeon first. More on that in a moment, but one thing to mention about this room. Casually, you'd be expected to push the block in the middle to run around the back side of the room with this lit stick. However, that is a bit slower than just going this way. And doing yet another pop-up here to get to this torch a bit faster, with no pushing involved. Um, there are some other reasons to finish Woodfall later though, most notably that having Great Fairy Mask, having the Hook Shot, and having um, the Gilded Sword make things go just a lot faster, since we have to collect all the fairies. 
As I mentioned before, dungeon compasses and maps are required in this category, so here we are getting the compass. Slash the chest, just because we can't stand it, or because I mashed B too many times. You will see some side hopping upstairs. On steep slopes like that, it is faster to side hop than to do Link's normal kind of trudging animation. And I'll use that a few times in the run. Minor optimization. teach these guys a lesson, and then we'll get our fairy reward. When uh, chests are spawning in a room, usually the move is to try to position Link directly in front of them so you can open them immediately. In that room it's a bit difficult, but in other rooms I'll be able to do it. Now here, instead of crossing this room normally to get down to this layer of the dungeon, the second floor, I'm going to do some jump slash recoil, which will allow me to just land on this ledge and take some damage. There is a slightly faster strat that is currently banned in Glitchless called Anti-Grav that allows Link to slide along the ceiling, and using that you can actually land much closer to the door that we're aiming for to get to this mini-boss, but we don't do that because it is now banned. It used to be allowed, but no longer. And here we get the bow. Now this is the real reason that we entered this dungeon at all. We want the bow in order to access a lot of other things in the game, including Snowhead. While we're here though, it is quick to get the map, so we're just going to go ahead and do that, using a kind of cool trick here. Normally when you bomb those flowers, they won't be able to eat you anymore after they explode, however during the eating, or the animation of eating the bomb, you also can just jump on the side and uh, roll off like that. This is the part of the dungeon where we joke about my health being dangerously low and being scared that I'm going to die. I am setting up for an intentional death warp here, and I'm going to do it like this. I'm going to drop a bomb here, and then wait a little bit, and then open the chest right before the bomb explodes. And the reason for that is that when Link dies, normally there is a kind of long cutscene of him lying on the ground and playing some sad music. but. That cutscene we just saw was not very long, because the sound of the chest opening and me getting the item was still going on, and that cancelled the animation. Now we're done with Woodfall Temple, we are going to head off to Snowhead, and on the way north, uh, we're gonna bonk. On the way north, we are going to enter North Clock Town and get the Great Fairy Mask. It is customary when someone heals you and makes you whole again to give them a replica of your face, so that is what is going to occur here. Hey, howdy. And now we'll be on our way. In each dungeon, there are 15 stray fairies to collect, and the Great Fairy Mask helps by uh, pulling the fairies towards Link when he's wearing the mask. It also helps casually by shimmering whenever there is a fairy in the room, letting you know to search for one, but of course, I already know where all of them are. Help! 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 
To speak a little bit more about movement in Majora's Mask, when rolling, it is optimal to wait a few frames before rolling a second time. R mashing rolls is not as fast as possible because Link rolls, or Link's roll speed is based on his movement speed prior to the roll. So it is good to accelerate a little bit into rolls. Funny how much practice can go into basic. Oh no. <laughs> Movement through areas like this one. But this game has so many just twists and turns in the pathways. And because we want to backwalk most of the time, it actually makes it pretty challenging to just move through an area optimally. Much like the Woods of Mystery we passed through earlier, knowing the path without having to um, ask the monkey, we do not need to talk to the owl here because even though these platforms are invisible, I know where they are. That saves a bit of time on the cutscene. Here we'll be getting the Lens of Truth, and I'll be throwing extra bomb there. Uh, this is a good place to stack up on bombs since these bushes have a high drop rate and we will be using quite a few bombs in Snowhead Temple. Now casually what would happen here is you would leave the lens cave using the lens to see the invisible blocks, see Darmani's ghost, and follow him to the uh, Goron grave. But Darmani's ghost is actually already in the Goron grave, we don't need to follow him all the way there, so we're just going to soar back and get there a little bit more quickly. This is the only time in the run, by the way, that I will equip the Lens of Truth. It is not terribly useful, much in the same way that we simply memorized that pattern of uh, invisible blocks on the way to the lens cave, the lens is um, more useful casually than it is to someone who knows the game very well. We are using it here, however, because this ladder can be a bit treacherous and I need it equipped anyway in order to heal Darmani's ghost. I am spamming the lens button <laughs> because that conserves magic.
Now that we are receiving the Goron Mask, we will be able to move quite a bit more quickly, so when traversing those areas that we just crossed, we will no longer need to be aiming back walks and things like that, for the most part. As I mentioned before, the cutscene or animation that plays when first putting on a new transformation mask does not play if transforming from another form like Deku. So I'm going to transform into Deku here first and then immediately into Goron to save myself a little time on that cutscene. Our next goal is to get the Goron lullaby while also completing a few other tasks in Snowhead. And so I'm going to get the hot spring water here to melt the Goron Elder, but I still need to go talk to the baby first. The hot spring water timer is just long enough to do this, so my movement has got to be pretty tight here. I think there's, there's 5 to 10 seconds of leniency. It's not that bad, but it is a little tough for a beginner. Goron rolling is a little bit weird in that how he interacts with the surfaces he's rolling on depends on which frame of the rolling animation he's on, which is not really possible to control for a human. And so when I rolled up that ledge before and stuck to it and almost rebounded off of the pole, that was pretty unusual. That only happens on some particular frames of the rolling animation. Usually you would get a jump off of that and be able to just continue the roll. So we've got to talk to the baby here, well, whoops, there we go, um, and then immediately leave and talk to the elder, or melt the elder with the spring water. It is worth mentioning that there's a trick called Lullaby Skip that allows you to get into Snowhead Temple without actually obtaining the Goron Lullaby first. However, there are a few reasons that we're not going to be doing that trick. Number one is that it is currently considered a glitch. There is no glitchless form of it as far as I know right now. It, there have been various incarnations of the trick, there are a few different ways to do it. Uh, and some of them have been considered glitchless and have been used in glitchless any percent before, but it is currently banned in glitchless any percent uh, because upon rethinking those strats, they were considered glitches. This is also 100%, so I need to get Lullaby anyway, and using Lullaby once I have it is much faster than doing the uh, Lullaby skip, which is kind of slow if you already have Lullaby. That's part one of the song, and then we go learn part two from the baby. And will I break the pots? Yes! So satisfying. Need to get some supplies from those pots, and it's very satisfying to just roll them in and get them without bonking. Yeah. One other kind of important ramification, but a subtle one of getting Lullaby here, is that it's going to turn on the torch that's uh, behind and to the right of Link right now. Well, it's not really visible, but it's going to uh, light that torch, and that'll allow us to get the rock sirloin from the hanging pots on the chandelier 
before leaving this Goron Shrine, and that'll allow us to never come back here in the run. Very convenient. Next order of business is to obtain that rock sirloin. So what we're going to do is light a, uh, a deco stick here to light the first torch in the sequence. But instead of lighting all of the torches to automatically light the chandelier, we're just going to light this one and then shoot an arrow through it. Much faster. The rock sirloin is supposed to be kind of a guessing game. You have to guess which pot it's in and just break all of them until you find something but it always spawns in the same one, so if I do a consistent setup in preparation for it, I can always find it. Unfortunately, it's kind of silly, but missing that, uh, that Goron roll can lose a lot of time. If you hit the wrong pot, or don't hit a pot at all. Uh, so here we're going to do kind of a weird thing. We usually don't see very much walking and back walking as Goron because we can roll, but since we have to carry this rock sirloin all the way over to the other, uh, to the mountain village, we just have to walk. Our reward for bringing the sirloin all this way is getting the Dangiro mask, which will be used to collect five frogs throughout this cycle in order to get one heart piece, one of the hardest to obtain heart pieces in the entire run. Or entire game, I suppose. And that's part of the reason that this cycle lasts so long, is that we have frogs to obtain in uh, Clock Town and the Swamp, but also in Great Bay Temple and Woodfall Temple. We won't be going there, there until three and a half hours into the run or so. One thing I'll be trying to do on most of my Goron rolls, but not this one right here, which is especially slow, is something called a Quick Goron Roll, which allows Goron to start a roll somewhat quickly even if he's on a slippery surface like snow or sand. And that's done just with some control stick manipulation. Uh, I didn't do it there because if done there, Goron would actually lose all of his momentum and not gain spikes by the time of the ramp, which would be disastrous. Don't worry about this guy, by the way. He will be alive and well even after this fall. We'll see him later in the run. He's fine. Don't mind the dramatic music. It's worth noting, I suppose, that owl statues can only be activated as human, which is why I'll always transform. It's a bit clumsy, but it is necessary. And now we just roll right into the dungeon. The section of Woodfall Temple that we already did was kind of an exception to this, but the dungeons in this run are generally my favorite parts just because there's so much to do, what with collecting the um, chest items as well as fairies, and just trying to move quickly, of course. Oh. 
here rather than stopping at the opposite end of this jump, hitting the barrel or something like that. If we simply curve the jump, it's possible to roll directly to the door. Hopefully this will not become a Goron bonking tutorial. No, that was pretty good. Uh, it is all too easy to bonk into doors and to teabag in front of them by accident. We'll, we'll definitely be seeing some of that later. Normally to complete this dungeon you'd need quite a few keys. I think we only get two, if I remember correctly. The main shtick of this dungeon is that there's a central column that can be raised and lowered, allowing access to different levels, but we're going to skip moving that entirely, which is kind of exciting. We'll be doing that in some fun ways. Now here we are back to bomb boosts. Normally you'd have to traverse a few extra rooms to get back to this one on the higher level and get up to this ferry, but using one bomb boost we can just get up here. This bomb boost is a little bit different from what we saw earlier in that we got even more height because we used a Goron Pound to rise in the air instead of a simple backflip. This will be extremely useful throughout the run. Now the next thing to do in this room is to press a switch that is under some ice. Fortunately, there is an exposed corner of the switch that we can roll into. And, <laughs> okay. There are so many glitches in this game, and it is so easy to clip sometimes, that that'll happen sometimes even when you're not trying to. Um, because it is possible to press a corner of that uh, switch that is exposed from the ice without clipping in, it is allowed to do that technique. That's valid for glitchless, even if you end up clipping in like that, so whoops. I'm going to do some kind of weird movement in this room in order to keep the snowball that we see up there on screen. And the reason for that is that snowball is cold when it is not on screen. Oh no, I missed. And if we throw a bomb up there and then the snowball is off screen when the bomb explodes, then it won't actually register as having exploded, and when we get back there, the snowball will still be there. This next room is one of the harder bomb boosts in the run, just because there are a bunch of enemies surrounding you and uh, you have to time it pretty well. I think, yeah, I, I missed it once here. It's too bad. And those enemies like to come and make the bomb explode earlier than you want it to. Here, casually, one would be required to use lens to see the bubble that I just popped, but I know where it is. And now here, I think I actually failed this once this run, so we'll get to see it twice. Here we want to go to the left to get to the wizard robe room. <laughs> and what we're going to try to do is do a 90 degree bridge jump instead of going all the way around. Um, this obviously was a failure and was a bit slow, but I think we get it this time. Just by getting the right angle here, we'll be able to get a jump over to this platform immediately. And here's our first mini-boss. Unfortunately, both mini-bosses in this dungeon are whiz robes, and they are one of the most annoying mini-bosses, so we'll have a lot of this to see. This fight is kind of cool though, because after getting two punches in, so after this punch here, the whiz robe is supposed to spawn and then have a little animation of running all the way around the room. But, between this animation that we see right now and the animation of running around the room, there is one frame of vulnerability where the wizard robe can be hit and actually take damage. And if we can successfully hit it on those frames, then we can skip that cutscene entirely, as I just did. Oh. 
Now, in this room, casually what you'd be expected to do is both to kill the freezers and to light all the torches to unlock the door to the right. That would allow you to raise or lower the column. I actually can't remember which one it is in this room. But again, we're not going to be raising or lowering that column at all. We just don't need to. So the only reason we enter this room is to get the fairy chest. Let's do a little cleanup before we start entering the upper levels. We've already been in this room, but it's more convenient to get the fairies here with uh, this angle and these equips. Very conveniently in this elevator room, we're actually going to be able to get on the elevator uh, without killing the freezer, just by using this angle we have here to light or to uh, melt the ice. And then there's a fairy chest in this room as well that casually would require lens. There are a bunch of invisible blocks. However, as usual, we'll simply be able to skip using lens, save the equip. And now we make our way to the top of the dungeon, where the boss room is, and we still need to get the boss key and several fairies along the way. Coming up on one of the more terrifying looking things in the dungeon, it's really not as bad as it looks. I'm just going to run up here and side hop to my doom. Casually the way to get to this little alcove is to use a Deku flower, but that's very slow. Now we're falling all the way to the bottom, and you might think, oh no, we just tried so hard to get to the top. But conveniently, after we get this last fairy, we can just void out as Deku, and that'll bring us back to our last entrance, which was way back at the top. Actually, I guess I showed this earlier when I failed that one bridge jump. Now, here's how we're going to get to different levels of the dungeon without raising the column. We just throw a bomb to blow up the snowball that's blocking our entrance, and then jump down to the platform. That is a bit tougher than it looks, but it is not too bad. We're actually going to do a second one in just a minute or two. Here we have our second wizard fight. I'm going to do that same thing, uh, prevent the cutscene from happening by hitting the wizard on the one frame of vulnerability. One thing to note about that is that while there is only one frame of vulnerability, Goron's attacks have multiple frames worth of hurt boxes. So as long as the hurt box is going on during uh, that frame of vulner vulnerability, I will successfully hit the wizard, making it a little bit easier than a one frame trick. Now with the boss key, the only remaining thing to do is to get to the boss room and defeat Goat. To do that, we are going to do another tunnel jump. You may have seen me shielding there when I landed. There's something called a jump slash cancel, or rather jump slash animation cancel, that allows you to skip the short animation of Link just kind of sitting on the ground after doing a jump slash. And the way to do that is to swing the control stick around after doing the jump slash, 
and you know, just cancels the animation. However, when I'm on a ledge like that, I don't exactly want to just be swinging my control stick wildly uh, without any guarantee that I'm not going to jump off the ledge. So holding shield allows me to do that. Now this fight is pretty interesting. It's roughly the same in gl both glitched and glitchless speedruns. But rather than chasing Goat around as Goron, the intended way, we're just going to stand on one particular point here and fire arrows. Turns out when you stop moving, Goat stops chasing you and just tries to fire lightning at you. But if it doesn't think it has a line of sight to you, then it won't fire any lightning. Unfortunately, <laughs> sometimes that'll happen. A stalactite will fall. And that's just very bad RNG. Uh, and can mean that the strat doesn't work. I got lucky there. Well, I got unlucky in that the stalactite fell at all, but I got very lucky that Go didn't hit me with the lightning. If it had, then I would have had to wait quite a bit more time for it to run all the way around the arena. So normally we would manipulate this so that Goat dies right in front of Link, and then you can exit the arena immediately, but because of that bad stalactite RNG, I have to roll all the way over here to collect the remains, or the hard container and the remains. And there is Snowhead Temple. I mentioned earlier that the reason we didn't complete Woodfall Temple in one pass was to avoid a cutscene. To elaborate a bit on that, right now we are seeing one of the two cutscenes that always plays when any dungeon is completed. We are seeing the giant cutscene. Every dungeon also has a cutscene of showing the area being cleared afterwards. For example, um, Snowhead turning from winter to spring or the swamp being purified, things like that. So we've got those two cutscenes to work with for every dungeon giant and purification and on the first dungeon we complete we also get we kind of get an elongated giant cutscene where we learn the oath to order which is about to happen and then if woodfall is the first completed dungeon we get an additional cutscene on top of that of talking to tattle that's the one that we're skipping by completing this dungeon first Will I get the song? So good. One fun thing to note, even though it's not relevant to this category at all, is that in glitched runs of this game, without SRM or Ace, Oath to Order is needed, so this cutscene is necessary to sit through, but all of the other giant cutscenes for the other completed dungeons can be skipped using a glitch called Song of Time Storage, which allows you to pick up the remains and then immediately play, well, immediately activate Song of Time to begin a new cycle, which is pretty cool. As I mentioned earlier, this first in-game day of this second cycle has been pretty packed. It's something like 3.45 p.m. in-game time right now, and we have already completed Deku Palace, we've already done uh, some of Woodfall Temple, we completed Snowhead Temple, we did everything to get Goron Mask, all that stuff. We still have a little bit of stuff left to do before we get to our real goal for day one, which is to get Epona and Garo Master, or uh, the Garo Mask, rather, from the ranch. First, because this is glitchless, we do need to get the keg, and to do that we need to complete keg trial. And while we're doing keg trial, we might as well do Goron Race, because it's right there. And then we have a few other things to do in Clock Town. There's really a lot to do in this game. Oh, 
Oops. Once again, when Goron is rolling and sticks to a ledge when you don't expect him to, that kind of stuff will happen. So here again, we get to see Goron doing some backwalking instead of rolling. I think this is the last time in the run, though. You'll see me throw the keg onto this bridge. Looks a little bit weird at first, but the wolfos that just spawned can run and attack you when you're on the bridge and cause you to drop the keg and cause the keg to explode. And that'll happen sometimes because Goron will sometimes just trip over the bridge. There's some... it's a pixel or something. Some small area of the bridge that you can trip on and it's kind of hard to avoid. So it's a lot simpler to throw the keg out of the Wolfos' range and avoid it completely. Now it's time for Goron Race, which... Oh man. It's a very RNG-based part of the run, but it's not entirely RNG, of course. We do have control of Goron Link through here, but... The other Gorons in the race are sometimes very aggressive and uh, at and mean. We'll see how this one goes. Generally speaking, the goal here is to get spikes as early as possible, which I did there, so that we're moving as quickly as possible, and then just try to keep spikes for the entire race. Even if doing that, though, it's possible to lose the race because there is significant, oops, significant rubber banding in the race, meaning that. If you're ahead, then the other Gorons will go faster. If you're behind, they'll go a bit slower. It's not reliable, though, so if you're behind at the very end, it's, uh, you can just plain lose. This is a pretty abysmal Goron race, I've got to say. I lost spikes there by bonking pretty early and have not been able to get them back yet. There we go. I'm going to avoid these ramps because getting hit in midair will cause Goron to lose spikes. Oh, boy. Oh, I remember this one. This... <laughs> that Goron ahead of me needs to do some serious rubber banding in order for me to be able to win. We'll see. Oh no. Okay, thank goodness. Conveniently slowed down right at the end just so I could knock into him. They're not always that nice. That was very lucky. Alright, having blown up the Goron racetrack, we do need to go back to this Goron over here to be able to get the keg certification so that we can buy a keg later. And we'll also receive a keg from him, which we'll use to bl uh, blow up the big rock in front of the ranch. I notice that I just side-hopped up that ledge to, to grab. That's a little bit faster than Link's normal climbing animation. We used that a few times in the run. Having received my keg, I'm going to soar back to Clocktown and finally use that bomber code that I got uh, in the first 20 minutes of the run. Now again, casually, what one would do is get that bomber code, enter the bomber's hideout, get the moon's tier, and then come back to Clocktown through the hideout. And the bombers won't let you join the gang and give you their notebook when you're Deku, but if you do that again as human on another cycle later on, then they will give you their notebook after you leave the hideout, or once you complete the bomber game again. What I'm going to do, since I already have the code and um, I am not Deku anymore, is enter the hideout and then immediately leave. And upon leaving, they will give me the bomber's notebook. The bomber's notebook is another requirement for 100%. 
We need to fill in all of the entries in the notebook, which just means helping all of the NPCs um, and getting all the masks, doing all the side quests and that kind of stuff. And that's why we're getting it now. We could get it some other time in the run, but we're about to start interacting with relevant NPCs and we want that to be recorded in the notebook. We're getting the cafe mask now so that we can set the midnight meeting. The Andrew Cafe side quest is one of the most involved in the whole game. And what's involved about it is that it requires multiple in-game time related events throughout the three-day cycle. For example, here I have to talk to Cafe or talk to Andrew, excuse me, around this time of day in order to set a midnight meeting. I will have to meet her there, get a letter, mail the letter, go talk to Cafe, get a pendant, give it to Andrew, uh, and then do some other stuff. And the reason that that side quest is so important is that it gives several different rewards. You get the um, letter to Mama from it, which you can redeem for either the Postman's Hat or Chateau Romani. We'll do both on different cycles. You get the letter, well, you can also use the letter from Andrew to uh, feed Toilet Hand, which we'll do. And you get Keaton Mask as well. So we're actually going to be completing that side quest on all three of the remaining uh, cycles. This one included, in order to receive all of those rewards. Oh my. Okay. We've just done a few things that are on the way to the ranch, but again, our ultimate goal here is to get to the ranch. We are heading there right now. We'll activate the owl statue. We will then use our keg to blow up the big rock. And then we'll get a Pona. I'm also going to attempt a small damage boost, a very minor time saver when blowing up the keg here. I'll drop the keg, transform into human, shoot the keg with an arrow to make it explode and then begin a backflip. I also didn't equip there. So that Link had damage boost backwards into where the boulder used to be, and I just end up a little bit closer to the loading zone. Despite being a very long category, it is worth putting minor optimizations in it, uh, just because saving time everywhere counts. It all adds up. What we're doing here is starting the alien sequence, which is kind of another long and involved side quest. In a moment, we'll do an archery minigame on Epona to win Epona and get Epona's song. And that'll allow us to come back later to do the alien sequence where we fend off the aliens from the barn. That'll get, a, get us a milk bottle and allow us access to the Romani mask later. That will be the next big in-game time event that we really need to make. Uh, just as we were making it to Epona and Gera Mask by 6pm, we'll need to make it to Aliens by 3.30 or so. I'll elaborate on that later. A good time for this minigame is... Actually, it's possible to get sub-20. 20, 20 seconds. I don't think this was a an exemplary one. Yeah. Best I've ever done is a 24, which is not too bad.
Somewhat interestingly, while casually one might be expected to ride Epona around to just get around Termina Field, we're not going to ride Epona very much. We're going to use her for a couple of things, but really only that. It's so much faster to just use Goron rolling most of the time. Here, however, we will ride her over to the Gorman racetrack so that we can get the Garrow Mask after that minigame. As I mentioned before, we need to get there by 6 o'clock, and I'm actually cutting it very close here. If I wanted to play it safe, I could easily just soar to the Milk Road Owl statue that I activated earlier, walk into the Gorman racetrack, and then call Epona and start the minigame, and that would save me some in-game time, but I was just trying to go fast here. So we're cutting it very close. So much of doing this run at all is knowing backups like that. Because in this run, there's a lot of stuff. And I have made mistakes doing basically all of it. This minigame is all about carrot management, and basically the idea is to spread out the carrots so that we get a lot of distance for our opponent's fast movement, and never run out of carrots because that takes the carrot or that makes the carrots take longer to respawn. And I'll ride right through that post that doesn't really exist. Great, we got the Garrow Mask. And we're a few seconds away from the night transition. There we go. Now there's only two other things we're going to do with Epona. Number one is ride Epona out to the... Um, Great Bay fence and jump over it. We actually could get over that fence glitchlessly with one of those bomb boosts like we used in Snowhead, but since we already have Epona with us, it's a little bit faster to just use her. In this section of the run, we will be getting the Zora Mask, which of course is super useful, and another really useful item, the Hook Shot, which will help us basically everywhere. Right here is another subtle difference between Japanese and English versions of this game. This one works in English's favor. On Japanese, it is pretty difficult to push Macau, or at least comparatively difficult. On English, we just have to hold A and push him. Very nice. This is one of the remaining longer cutscenes in the run. Uh, not just this one where Macau trudges up the beach, but also the cutscene following playing Song of Healing for Macau. It has some really nice music though.
And now we steal his face. We now have all three of the main transformation masks. Of course, we don't have Fierce Deity Mask. We'll get that at the end. Once again, when transforming to Zora for the first time here, I will transform into Goron first. It's also convenient here because Goron will allow me to reach the shore sooner, uh, more quickly, but it'll also skip that animation. Now here, while activating this owl statue, I'm going to stand a little bit behind it so that once I slash, Link will be launched into the water by the recoil, moving me a little bit closer to Pirate's Fortress, which is the next place I'm going. You'll notice here that I'm diving out of the water repeatedly. These are what are called dolphin dives, and it is a bit faster than just swimming underwater. It's actually significantly faster, but it also depends on how high you go out of the water, how optimal your lines are, because of course this is inefficient uh, line-wise. I'm making a sinusoid instead of going straight to the loading zone. In terms of 100%ing the game, there are a few things to do in Pirate's Fortress. One is to get a picture of one of the pirates so that we can obtain the seahorse from the fisherman, which I will do momentarily. The others are to get the hookshot and to collect the four Zora eggs that are hidden here. Unfortunately, we only have one bottle free right now, so we're only going to get one of the Zora eggs right now, but we're going to come back later to get the other three when we have more available bottles. Oh, there's also a hard piece, which we'll be getting shortly from the jail in the sewers. There's another subtle movement optimization here. When I bonk into these wooden walls to cause them to explode, I'm going to stop swimming shortly before hitting them and then start swimming immediately after. This cancels a longer bonking animation, we just get a short one instead. Oh, I missed it there. So that's what it looks like when you don't do that. This door closes again on a timer, but it's not too tough to make it. Doing dolphin dives is still optimal in here, but it's just a bit hard with all of the obstacles, so I just do them where I can. I'm going to transform into human here before climbing the ladder, both because I'm going to use bow later, but also because for some reason Zora climbs ladder or climbs ladders the slowest of all the transformations. So might as well just do the human transformation first. Now again, here there is a lot to do, but our only goal is going to be getting the hook shot and the egg that's in that same room right now. So we'll just make our way to the center immediately and up to the hook shot room. This is another slight difference between English and Japanese. On the Japanese version of the game, at night, 
it is possible to enter the hookshot room from below uh, without hitting the beehive first. That normally scares the pirates away. And still make it past the first guard pirate. But on English, it is not. So we have to come up here first, shoot the beehive. And we are actually saving a little time here by not activating a cutscene that would normally activate here. You have to stand a little bit closer to the beehive for a cutscene to start playing. And by standing in that position, we can shoot the beehive without hitting that first. And now we have the hookshot. This will be useful, again, basically everywhere. It's one of the most useful items in Glitchless. Our next move is to deposit that egg in the tank so that we free up our bottle again. And the movement I do to get up to the tank where I drop the egg will not be very intuitive. It's going to look a little weird. Let's see it. Normally you'd just climb the ladder there, but it turns out that getting a jump from that little platform that I stood on is about a third of a second faster if you get it. The jump, however, is kind of weird because normally Zora can't actually make that jump. He won't reach the tank and will just fall to the ground. But if he's rubbing against the wall, then the game decides that he will indeed grab the ledge and make the jump. There are two other times I'm going to approach that tank, and I think I try it every single time. I don't remember whether I get it every time this run. We'll see. The goal in here is to be told that we are a crafty one for getting a good picture of the pirate. Ah, we're a crafty one. Now we have our seahorse. The seahorse normally is useful for just getting to Pinnacle Rock, but we'll see later. We don't really need it for that, we just need it for our heart piece. Our next move is to complete the Oceanside Spider House, which will be a fun aiming minigame essentially. <laughs> There is a significant amount of RNG in this spider house, unfortunately. Not in the movement of the spiders, because that's pretty consistent, but in getting the heart piece towards the end. One of the things to do in this spider house is to talk to all of the stall children throughout, we'll see some in this room, uh, while wearing the captain's hat, and have them tell you the code so that you can shoot arrows, oops, shoot arrows at the masks, and open a gate to a heart piece. But we don't have Captain's Hat yet, and talking to all of the stall children is kind of slow. So we're just going to guess that code. And the code is RNG, so we'll see how nice it is. Behind this next painting, it's possible to kill the spider while knocking down the painting. I just did, so that we just have the token left.
And here is that mask code I was talking about before. If I remember correctly, this one was pretty bad. So because we're just guessing, the best way to do it is to just guess in an algorithm of guessing a mask, and once you get one, guess the mask closest to it. And this code has a series of masks that are as far apart as possible. Green, red, green, so I keep guessing wrong as a result. The only rule for this mask code is that it cannot have two of the same color in a row. These are the arrow drops... Oh, I missed one. That uh, I was talking about before are not guaranteed on Japanese, but are guaranteed on English. So the fact that I just was able to get those arrow drops... Well, I missed one, but... Uh, means that it is possible for me to still complete this puzzle. This is really unfortunate RNG, by the way. It is, you know, conceivably possible to get this code within six arrow shots. But it's taking me... How many? Almost 40, I think. This is an unusual way to do this spider house. I just, I noticed there that I hadn't gotten the arrow drop from that one pot, so I went and got it. We'll need some fire arrows to finish this up. And now in this room, we will be setting up for an intentional death warp, just like we had in Woodfall Temple. I'm going to take some damage from this guy and from this bow. Death warping out of this room will be just a little bit faster than going back to the front of the mini dungeon normally. Whoops a little more damage from the boat, so that I'm at a half heart value. I'm going to take three hearts of damage from this very last Skulltula, kill it, pull a bomb, and then die during the sound of retrieving the Skull Token. And again, that will cancel the long death cutscene, leaving me with a short one and warping me back to the beginning of the Spider House. Our reward for this is retrieving a wallet upgrade. Now, casually, this would usually end up being the second wallet upgrade, because you can also get a wallet upgrade from depositing 200 or more rupees in the bank. And this one would take a little bit longer to get to, but we haven't gotten that one yet, and it doesn't really matter what order you go in, you still just get the first wallet upgrade from the first one of those you do, and the second from the latter, so later we will deposit 200 rupees in the bank and re receive the giant's wallet, which is the largest wallet upgrade. But first, first we need to bonk, I guess. First, we're going to complete the beaver races. One of uh, the most exhilarating parts of the run. The rewards for the beaver races are one bottle and one heart piece. Unfortunately, we have to complete two beaver races per reward. So I'm going to beat the beavers twice in order to get a bottle and two more times, identical races, in order to get the heart piece. Just something that every 100% run has to do. Now surprisingly, 
as monotonous as the beaver races may seem to a viewer, it is actually pretty engaging for a runner because, as I mentioned before, optimal Zora movement in the water is to be dolphin diving wherever possible. And so I'll be trying to dolphin dive between the rings without bonking very much. Having over 40 seconds left on the in-game clock at the end of this one is pretty good. It's like I got a... Oh no! Oh no! Well, I was gonna get a 42 or something. Too bad. And then on the second beaver race, the big brother where there are more rings to collect, I think the a good time is like 36 left on the clock, if I remember correctly. That was an unfortunate bonk near the end. That's the thing about bonking in this minigame, is that because controlling Zora sinking or rising underwater can be so finicky, one bonk can actually lead to a lot of time loss compared to bonks in other places in the run. Here's our first reward, the bottle. Thank goodness those beaver races are over. Oh wait, we have to do two more. Let's go back over and say hello again. And off we go. You'll notice in-game time right now is, what, 11.15, 11.30? Yeah, something between those two. And we are still trying to make it to back to the ranch to defeat the aliens by 3.30 or so. We still have quite a few things to do, too. We have to go to the observatory, or we have to go to the ranch and get some maps. We have to go to the observatory and get the moon's tier and some other uh, a heart piece in Termina Field. We have to do some grottos. We have to do some stuff in Clocktown. We have to complete the entire swamp spider house, as well as a couple of other things in the swamp. And we have some things to do in Mountain Village. So lots to do, and we're spending our time doing beaver races.
Oh, I mentioned before that a good in-game time for this is 40, uh, 40 plus seconds left on the clock. I just got a 33. The second round of beaver races that we're doing right now uh, has 10 fewer seconds on the clock at the beginning of the race, starting at 150 instead of two minutes. So that was equivalent to a 43 on the first race. Pretty good time. And a 27 here. Yeah, that's about as well as I did the first time around. Okay, beaver race is complete. We receive our heart piece. We can be done with the beavers for the remainder of the run. Let us leave. Oh, nice slow walk. Here I'm going to try to get a dive over here to not bonk. Thank goodness. While we're over in this area of the map, we'll just kill this like-like in order to receive the heart piece, and then we'll never have to come here again. This is also nice for rupee routing. I haven't talked too much about rupees since I mentioned collecting them in uh, Woods of Mystery. But we need rupees for a few things here. We're going to start buying tingle maps uh, immediately after we soar here to uh, Romani Ranch. And we also need 100 rupees to buy a heart piece from the business scrub in the grotto outside the observatory. We are also going to need rupees to deposit our sword to get the razor sword. And then even more rupees to compete in the dog race, or to bet on the dog race. So there's a lot of rupee management to do here. Fortunately, rupees are pretty readily available in various places. We get them in dungeons, we get them in the overworld. Um, so we should be set. We're about to spend 60. Also going to take a picture of Tingle here to prepare for getting the... There we go. The Picto heart piece in the swamp in a few minutes. One kind of interesting thing coming up, we're about to play Goron Lullaby in various grottos to obtain the Gossip Stone heart piece. And I mentioned pretty early on in the run that one of the reasons that I'll fail songs sometimes, a lot of people do, is by playing the first note a little bit too early. Right after I pull out the ocarina, uh, if I begin to play the song immediately, most of the time, it won't work. The game won't register the first notes uh, until you've waited a little bit. But if pulling ocarina in front of a gossip stone, the game does register those notes so I can begin playing the song immediately. This will save a few seconds over the course of the run. Now here I'm farming up to 60 rupees. Hopefully I get it. Oh my. Okay. Um, so that I can finish out my 100 with two red rupees from this tree, and I will have enough rupees to obtain the heart piece from the business scrub. I'm going to do another damage boost over this fence, so that we never really need to use Bomber's hideout. Uh, or the flower to get in his Deku, because that's a bit slower. In the observatory, looking through the telescope, there are actually three things to do, not just getting the moons tier, but we're first going to activate this cutscene of this business scrub flying out of Clocktown, and now activating the cutscene of the Gwei 
flying towards us before activating the Moon's Tear cutscene. This means that all these cutscenes are going on simultaneously, which saves us a bit of time over watching them separately. And the reason we activated those other two cutscenes is because this business scrub is the one that's going to sell us the heart piece I was just talking about. And this Gwei is going to drop 20 rupees, which will be very nice for our rupee management. We do need to watch the business scrub fall into the hole and watch the Gwei drop the rupee, otherwise the game will not count those things as having happened. So we're just going to wait here. There's the rupee. And now we'll get the moon's tier and do another damage boost to get over this fence again. It's worth mentioning that some damage boosts are harder than others for various reasons. There's one I mentioned that was kind of hard in Snowhead Temple, because there were a bunch of enemies nearby that could make the bomb explode, or uh, just hit Goron. But some are harder than others because the ledges we're trying to get up are higher. Some ledges we jump over are relatively low, and that makes it pretty easy to time the jump relative to the bomb explosion, but the higher ones can be pretty small frame windows. Having obtained the heart piece, we get a few more rupees, enter another gossip grotto where we're going to play lullaby another time. The goal is to make all of these gossip stones red. We see that one already is, this is our second one. And the other two we're actually not going to do for another uh, half hour or so. Something like that. I am a little low on rupees here, so I am trying to farm rupees from grass. If I remember correctly, I get really lucky and get a red rupee here. Yeah. That's very helpful. It wasn't necessary, but just makes rupee management a little easier. Here, we're going to do another gainer. We're going to do that backflip to grab a high ledge. Oh, I missed. This one's a little weird. And that's a very high ledge, but we can grab it as Zora. Very convenient having a tall form. And here we're meeting Andrew for the midnight meeting to get the letter to Cafe. Again, this cycle we're actually going to do as much of the Andrew Cafe side quest as is possible to do in one cycle. We're getting this letter, we're going to mail it, um, we're going to get the pendant from Cafe, we're going to give it to Andrew, we're going to meet Cafe at Zack on Side Out, and eventually get the couple's mask. We have yet another gainer here to prevent us from having to go all the way around this area to get to the chest. And now we are finally giving the moon's tear to this business scrub. Again, we didn't do this in the first cycle, because we didn't need to, we could just gain her up to the clock tower, and it would have been very slow to do it because we would have had to go through the bomber's hideout. But because this time we could combine it with getting that heart piece with 100 rupees, and uh, just some bomb boosts to get into the observatory, it was pretty fast. And we're doing it in the first place, not because we need the heart piece anymore, but because we need the title deed that goes with this to complete that title deed trading quest, and to get some other heart pieces later on. I guess it is worth noting that the title deeds themselves are not required for 100%, just the heart pieces that they lead to, but glitchlessly, the only way to get to those heart pieces, or some of the heart pieces anyway, is with the title deeds. Last thing of Clocktown cleanup for right now, we need to get the Bremen mask simply by talking to Guru Guru. And then we're going to head over to the swamp, where we have a few things to do. The biggest one being completing the swamp spider house, which will grant us the Mask of Truth. The Mask of Truth and the Bremen Mask are very useful to have here, because when we go back to the ranch to complete aliens, we'll have those ready so that we can do the other things on the ranch, the dog race track and the cuckoo shack. Yeah. 
Now this title deed gives us access to this flower which we can use to get on top of the hut here and get the heart piece. But we're actually not going to use it. We don't need it. We're going to get to that heart piece through a, a pop-up after we do some things inside the hut. Again, just doing this so that we can get the next title deed, um, which will be necessary for getting a heart piece. Here we give over a picture of Tingle, get another hard piece. And now we get to do the big octo skip I talked about way earlier in the run. This is again a different, whoops, missed the pop up. Uh, a different big octo skip from what any percent would do as Deku. Here we just aim a Goron roll and roll right by it. Now at this point in the run, I could have just killed the big octo, and it's only very slightly slower to do so, but it is slower. Much like the full dungeons. The spider houses are a lot of fun to play. There's just a lot of aiming to do, a lot of tight movement, just a lot to do packed into one small space. Oh no. Speaking of a lot of aiming to do, there usually isn't quite that much aiming to do. Here we can conveniently kill this Skulltula through the column. Nice sword hitbox. And instead of using Deku Flowers to get over here, we're just going to jump quite a bit faster than Transformer. Part of our rupee routing here is jumping onto the pots. It's kind of a weird jump, but manageable. Get some rupees here, and go over, get over to this area easily. Kind of interestingly, from a routing perspective, we need sword right here to cut the vines that I just cut. Nothing else will cut those vines, so glitchlessly it's the only way to get to this Skulltula. So we cannot have deposited the sword before coming here, otherwise we just wouldn't be able to get that one. With glitches though, it's possible to get that with a weird shot. Now is a good time to start talking about managing in-game time for aliens. The time in-game is currently almost 3am, and 
The way that Aliens works on the farm is that Romani tells you to get to the farm at, I think, 2.30 a.m. when the aliens spawn, but the aliens don't actually reach the barn until 3.45 or so. So it's around 3.30 if we have uh, time inverted, that is to say moving slowly, that we need to soar to the barn in order to get there in time to kill the aliens. Meaning I still have a little bit of time left to do some stuff in Mountain Village. Now, ideally, we're going to uninvert, meaning make time move quickly, during the aliens sequence so that it goes by more quickly because we need to do it all the way until 5.15 a.m. But I'll probably do that after I've completed everything or shortly before I complete everything, uh, just to make sure that I have enough in-game time and don't lose the run to failing aliens. Here's our Mask of Truth. And now we sort of mountain village. We have a few things to do here. Just cleaning up springtime stuff. We're going to get, or what? We're going to deposit our sword for the first sword upgrade. We're going to get a heart piece underwater. And we're going to do the next step in the title deed trading sequence and get that heart piece as well. It's actually going to be a surprisingly long time that we go without a sword, but thankfully, because we've already done the Swamp Spider House, and just based on the stuff we're going to do here, we really don't need a sword for the next little bit. Pretty common to get harassed by the Gwei here. Let's see if it happens. Nope, no Gwei harassment today. Very good. Now, if I were to play this risky, I would probably uninvert. Play the song of inverted time right here. I don't think I'm going to do it yet, though. I'm going to play it a little safer. Finally, it is time to return to the ranch and save the, the uh, cows from the aliens. One thing to mention coming up is something called Barn Shot. It turns out that the barn that houses the cows that the aliens are trying to get to doesn't have collision on, I believe, three of the four walls during the alien sequence. Um, okay, here I go uninverting to make time pass faster. So I'm going to roll up to one of the aliens, shoot it, and then shoot the next one through the barn. It's not a clip though, so it is allowed and glitchless. The barn just doesn't have collision there. Here's the barn shot. There we go. Saves me a little time running over to the other side. And in this alien sequence, there are eight aliens across the field, and they move slowly enough that if I begin killing them after 4 a.m., which is right now, then they don't have enough time to get to the barn, even if I just ignore them for the rest of the in-game time. So I'm just going to kill all of them one more time, and then I'll have time to run over to the gate and collect some rupees. Ow. 
Again, thinking about in-game time here, I'm gonna do this as human instead of as Goron, even though it's much slower, and this is just because this alien sequence is going to last until 5.15 in-game time, regardless of how quickly I move. So I can just do this as human and save myself the time spent, or that would be spent transforming to and from Goron. Here's our third bottle of the run. We have milk in it. That's going to be very useful later for getting the mirror shield. And next I have a little bit of song playing to do. I've got to make time go slower again using the song of inverted time. And I'm going to play a song of double time as well, just to advance to day two. Before I can do the other mini games that are on the ranch, which are only open during the day. Speaking of advancing to day two, we are now a bit over two hours into the run and finally getting to the second day of the second cycle. We're, we're, we're almost two hours into the second cycle alone. And finally getting to the second day. We're doing a lot in that first day. Okay, here's some more significant RNG in the run, the dog race. The way dog race works is when wearing Mask of Truth, Link can pick up a dog and uh, see what it's thinking. And if the dog on English says rough, not r rough or who whine, but just rough, then it has a speed boost that'll make it more possible for it to win. Gold dog has the fastest base speed, but white dogs have the next fastest. So I tried gold dog and I tried a, a, white do a couple of white dogs and got bad text. Here is one finally with good text. So I'm gonna bring it back here and if I get first or second place, whoops, then I will win enough on my bet in order to proceed with the run. If I get third through fifth place, then I'll have to do it again. And if I get worse than that, then I will lose all of my rupees and have to figure something out. There are some backup rupees, but that's a pretty big time loss. Now, even with a white dog or a gold dog, and good text, it is possible to just flat out lose this race. I've done it several times before, and it's very unfortunate. However, I think I got first place this time. Good RNG. Well, I say good RNG, but I had to try several dogs to get a good one. Could be worse. So now that we've won one over 150 rupees, we get the heart piece, and my wallet is full, which will be very convenient for getting the next wallet upgrade later. Next is the Cuckoo Shack, which does have some RNG in where the um, the baby cuckoos move, but the RNG usually isn't too bad. This RNG is actually pretty good. You can see that. The cuckoos are clumped pretty closely together for the most part. And now we get the bunny hood. I mentioned before that the main mode of locomotion we'll have here is Goron rolling, and we're about to do that again. The bunny hood is a pretty popular mask for going fast in casual play, but again, it's not really all that useful in a speedrun. We are going to use it later though in Stone Tower Temple. It's going to see a fair amount of use, just because we're going to have to stay human for most of that dungeon in order to be shooting elemental arrows. Having completed our tasks on the ranch, 
we are going to leave the ranch for the last time with Creamia here by advancing to night two and completing her escort side quest. All we've got to do here is shoot the pursuing Gorman brothers, or I mean, uh, masked bandits, before they reach the milk bottles, or the milk jugs. And this kind of works the same as the alien sequence did earlier, we only have to shoot them a few times before they don't have enough time left to break the bottles. So I'm just going to shoot them uh, six to ten times, I use a music cue to know when to stop, and then I'm going to face down to reduce lag and they will not have enough time left to break the bottles before we finish the escort. Our reward here is the Romani Mask, which we'll get to use way later in the run, like almost six hours in. Unfortunately, we don't get a hug from Creamia. That only happens if you've already gotten that mask on a previous cycle, which of course would never happen in a speedrun. You'll notice, by the way, that I try to drop Goron Spikes before entering a grotto, and that is for a pretty funny reason. If you enter a grotto with Goron Spikes, there's a chance that the game will set your entrance point for returning back to the overworld right over top of the grotto, meaning that when you jump out of the grotto, you'll just fall right back in instead of landing on the ground. Here, I think I actually missed this, but if you turn around and punch this rock, yeah, I missed it. Uh, then it'll recoil Goron back closer to the grotto. Unfortunately, I was just a little bit too far away there. Finally, having played the song in front of four Gossip Stones in those grottos, I got the heart piece. And now we just have a little bit of grocery shopping to do. 
the first thing I'm going to do is deposit these 200 rupees that I have, and that will give me the second wallet upgrade reward. So I'll have the giant wallet and we'll be able to hold 500 rupees. That's pretty important for a few things. Later we'll have to buy the all night mask for 500 rupees. Uh, we'll spend rupees on various other things as well, and we will need to collect 5,000 rupees by the end of the run in order to get a heart piece from this banker. Right now we are going to withdraw some more of those rupees now that we've gotten the wallet so that we can buy a keg, which we'll use in an hour or two. We're going to buy some bomb chews, which we'll use in Great Bay Temple. And we will buy a red potion, which we will use to get the stone mask in Akana in just a few minutes. Also, while we're in the trading post, which we're going to right now, we're going to set the Scarecrow's Song, which, oh my. Uh, the Scarecrow's Song only has one necessary use in Glitchless 100%. We're going to use it in Snowhead to get a heart piece. The Scarecrow is also useful in Great Bay for getting a heart piece casually, but I'm going to do a somewhat precise jump to get there without the use of the Scarecrow instead. Last couple of things to do in Clocktown, we need to talk to Cafe to get the pendant to deliver to Andrew to further the Cafe or the Andrew Cafe quest. We're also going to talk to the frog in here to prepare for getting the Don Giro heart piece in an hour and a half or so. Speaking of in-game time events before, we do need to get to the inn here before 8.30 when it closes. That's not a very tight one, but is something to pay attention to. If we get here after it closes, it is still possible to get in, but it would just take quite a bit longer. And now we are off to Ikana for the first time. This is the other time in the run where we'll use Epona. It is slightly faster and just a lot easier to use Epona to jump over the two fences coming up because the enemies around here can really screw up some Goron bomb boosts. Now I did get jinxed there by the blue bubble and you'll see Link is glowing blue, that means I can't pull a sword. But that really doesn't matter at all here. I don't even have a sword because I deposited for the upgrade earlier. Fortunately, I can still use other items like bombs and sticks and stuff. And it's actually a good time to mention another difference between Japanese and English. On the Japanese version of the game, there's a technique called power crouch stabbing, where crouch stabs store the damage value of the most recently used attack. Which means that crouch stabs can be very powerful for combat, but we don't have that in the English version of the game, so we're just going to do this without sword, we don't have one, and uh, as Goron instead. Now here, I dropped a bomb before playing Sonata, and during this cutscene of Kida awakening and starting to lumber away, the bomb will explode, damaging Kida and causing him to turn around. And that will allow us to do this fight very quickly, rather than the casual way of having to kill the enemies before this flame wall to get Kita's attention. 
This fight is a little, uh... yakety saxy. Okay, it looks like I didn't fail it. Yeah, okay. I got six good hits. Sometimes Kido will just push you away and not let you hit him, and it's... it's a time. Here we're coming up on the captain's hat, and I'm going to do <laughs> a scary jump over here. There we go. That jump, you have to get a roll on the, f uh, I think it's the first or second possible frame after uh, after the transformation cutscene in order to make it with that jump and be holding perfect up on your notch. If you're not doing those things, you'll fail the jump and have to roll all the way around and hook shot over, and it's a pain. So now we're going to enter Grave Night 2, as it is Night 2, and that's the one we can enter. However, we are actually going to do all the things we need to do in Grave Night 1 as well, with a very annoying jump. I believe I failed it twice this run. Thankfully it doesn't lose too much time. This next room has platforms that are visible with the lens of truth, but by just holding left, we can cross the room very quickly. Without seeing where we're going. Here's the first iron knuckle fight of the run, which goes back pretty quickly with uh, a simple Goron strat. Whoops. There we go. Gotta activate it and then pound and punch a couple of times. Then we're just going to punch, we're going to time some punches so that it doesn't have time to hit us, but it becomes vulnerable just in time for our punch to hit it. That strat is kind of precise and a little bit scary because the enemy does so much damage that it can easily kill you, and that would cost a lot of time. Okay, now it's time for some cool movement that's really excruciating to fail. I'm going to target the wall here to set up an angle and roll across this room to get damage boosted by the Skultula over to this area. And next, I'm going to try to jump on a Stalagmite that has some collision on top of it in order to get to the Day 1 Grave, which we're not really supposed to have access to right here. Unfortunately, the collision on top of the Stalagmite is pretty small and hard to... Yeah, so you saw I kind of hit it there, but I didn't get the jump. This is a really finicky jump, and again, you can do it as many times as you want. There we go. Um, get a lot of- oh no! <laughs> right, I, no, I get it again right after this. Whoops. Whoops. Alright. That's a- that's a fun mistake. Just wanted some extra practice on that jump. And time for our second Iron Knuckle fight, which will grant us the Song of Storms. Same exact strat as before, nothing new to it. There is a third Iron Knuckle fight very close to the end of the run, like minutes from the end of the run, that will do as human, which is very slightly different, but still basically the same idea. Yeah. 
This is kind of a long detour and cutscene to get Song of Storms, which is kind of unfortunate because we're only going to use this song twice in the run. But that's kind of true for some of the other songs too. We only use Opponent's song once, and we only use New Wave Bossa Nova once as well. Actually, a slight amendment to that, we do use either Opponent's Song or Song of Storms near the very end, too, in kind of a weird way. So, at least he gets a little more use. Alright, we've concluded our business in Graves 1 and 2. Unfortunately, we can't get to Grave 3 right now, otherwise we'd be able to do Dampe much earlier in the run. We will just have to wait till night three for that. So we are off to enter the kind of canyon. And on the way we will pick up the stone mask here. Oh right, we equip lens here too. So two times in the run we need to equip lens. And here's the one time we're going to equip the Garrow Mask, until the moon, so that we can get up this ledge. Oh, that's not the Garrow Mask. There we go. Oh no. Gotta fumble some equips here and there. There is another way to get up this ledge that's almost glitchless. It's, I believe, allowed in Bug Limit where you do a long seam walk to get up. Uh, I, I'm actually not sure of the details, but you do a seam walk to get up to a ledge that's almost kind of out of bounds, maybe? And it's not allowed in this category. Here's a trick called Ice Arrow Skip, which is pretty easy. Uh, normally what you're expected to do here is to freeze these two Octoroks with ice arrows to jump across them to that platform and then use the hookshot to get to the tree, but by standing in a pretty precise position, we can just hookshot from here. Which is kind of a big sequence break in that you'd have to enter Great Bay Temple to get the ice arrows, and we have not even come close to doing that yet. This is the part of the run where everyone says, what, you can do that with a stick? Yep. You can activate owl statues with a stick. Very convenient because we don't have a sword right now. And I moved in that kind of weird wavy motion in order to be able to get spikes before hitting the ramp so that I could get here a little bit quicker. Here is our first use of Song of Storms in the run. And this is a relatively long cutscene as well.
Next, we are off to Snowhead to do some... What are we going to do? We're going to get the Scarecrow Heart piece, and we're going to... Oh, no! <laughs> Here, we're apparently going to play Song of Storms again. Get mixed up. Alright, now we're going to go to Snowhead. And we're going to get a heart piece from the Scarecrow, and we're also going to finally get the Fairy Reward. Remember, in Snowhead Temple, we collected all 15 fairies, but we actually never went to the Fairy Fountain to get the reward afterwards. It didn't make sense to do it then, because it makes sense to do that at the same time as this Scarecrow heart piece, and we didn't have Scarecrow song yet. So we're just doing it now. Oh no, I lost spikes. Unfortunate. Once again, casually lens is required here, but I know where the platforms are. And after getting this heart piece, we'll just void to get back to the beginning of the area, which actually, now that I think about it, is the only thing you can do from here. I guess you could soar. Now we head to the Fairy Fountain to receive double magic, which will be very useful. It's worth mentioning here that we're doing a lot of just kind of general cleanup stuff and preparation, like going to Akana and hitting the Owl Statue and all that right now, because this is a part where in-game time is not very tight at all. I basically have all the in-game time in the world to do these things. Um, whereas before, I was kept on a tight schedule by getting Epona before 6pm and getting to Aliens by 3.30. This is much more relaxed. Alright, our next move is to Mountain Village to receive our sword upgrade that we had deposited our sword for. And then, because I have the gold dust already from completing the Goron race, I will immediately give the sword back with the gold dust. Then I will advance time to day 3 so I can receive the Gilded Sword, which is the final sword upgrade, and which survives Song of Time. And now it is finally time to return to Woodfall Temple. We began Woodfall Temple uh, over two hours ago, and didn't finish it again because we would have had an extra cutscene, and because it just goes so much more quickly with Hookshot, and with Great Fairy Mask, and with Gilded Sword. We will see that shortly. Immediately I get to skip some Deku flight by using Hookshot on these torches. And next I'm going to do a somewhat precise torch Hookshot. Uh, this torch you can't just Hookshot anywhere, you have to Hookshot one line of pixels near the top, otherwise you get a clank or you miss entirely. There we go. 
And I'm going to do that to get the switch early, which will activate this chest. Oh, I missed. Next, we collect the three fairies that are in here. Again, we were in this room earlier, but it was just so slow, or it would have been so slow to get the fairies. In fact, I don't think we could have even gotten the low one, the underwater one. I'm doing some backflips so that these fairies will rise above the fences. I had to wait for a moment there so that the fairy would be collected before I shot the eye. The fairy can't be collected during the cutscene, and I'm going to transform and take off Great Fairy Mask immediately afterwards, so I needed to collect it first. And here we're going to fight Gecko in order to both talk to the frog that spawns after you defeat, De uh, defeat Gecko, and to get the boss key. Bombs are so useful for this fight. You see the Deku flowers that are strewn about the room. That's the intended way to knock over the turtle. It's getting into those flowers and then shooting up as Deku when the turtle is above you to knock it over. But bombs are just so much quicker. And that's not even really a sequence break. It's You can get bombs whenever. Now we just have a few more fairies to collect and then a Dolwa to defeat and the dungeon is complete since we already got the dungeon item in our first pass. This is another very convenient thing, we have fire arrows here. So rather than having to light the torches in this room separately and raise the middle platform, we can just light that one with a fire arrow. Saving a good amount of time. Here I'm going to kill this pesky dragonfly before popping these bubbles to collect the fairies. And there's a bit of an awkward jump here to this platform, but it works. Some side hops to the lower one. And that should be all of our fairies. We'll collect the remaining two that are floating towards us in a moment. Can skip the puzzle of this room with the hookshot. And we are in Adola's room. Now, it's a pretty cool strat for defeating Adola quickly. First off, normally this fight would take a lot longer than it's about to, but we have the Gilded Sword, which is super powerful in comparison to the Kokiri Sword. So I'm not actually going to use any arrows to to stun Adola. I'm just going to wait for an audio cue, and when I hear it, I'm going to do a jump slash. That will oh, there's a second audio cue. There we go. Um, that will make it all a miss, and then a few quick spins later, he's already dead. Very quick fight.
Having now completed our first two dungeons, we're going to soon be getting ready to enter Great Bay Temple, all the things associated with that. But first, we've got to clean up a few things in the swamp. Got to bring the Deku Princess back to the Deku Palace, complete the butler race to get the Mask of Sense, and get some magic beans in preparation for events to come. And now we get to see another reason that Hookshot is really useful to have upon finishing Woodfall Temple. Instead of having to use Deku flowers to get everywhere here, we can just Hookshot the chests. And it'll also be useful to have Goron masks so we can roll through this water, which is not deep enough that Goron drowns, so we'll be able to just roll. Heart piece, gonna do yet another pop up here. There we go. And make our way to the fairy fountain to get great spin. It is admittedly kind of tough to see where you're going in this swamp area with all these uh, grass textures. Got to avoid all of the lily pads as Goron. I recently learned about an ex a pretty minor time save that I don't do yet. I should learn it to skip these guards instead of uh, reading through this text. But as you can see, that was pretty quick anyway, so. Oh no, I didn't get far enough on the platform. And here's the last thing we need to do while we're in Deku Palace. We're just going to go over to the other wing, the one that we didn't go through to get Sonata earlier in the run. And we're going to get some magic beans using some more bomb boosts. That was one of the easier ones. I was talking earlier about how different height ledges are different difficulties. That's a very low ledge, as is this one. 
And we don't only need magic beans in order to get all of the items for 100%, we also need... Well, we'll need one of them for the cliff heart piece in Great Bay. And we'll need five of them for bottom of the well to get the mirror shield. So here we are buying six. Well, getting one for free and buying five. Da na na na! It's the most intense counting that we've done so far this run. And now it's time for Butler Race. Butler Race... Well, it's just as much of a race as Beavers is in the sense that you don't actually have to win the race, you just have to make it to the end on time. But, um... It's... Essentially Bonkfest. And is very exciting. It is possible with some risky strats and just good gameplay to beat the butler to the end. I don't think I did that this run. I've done it, I think, once before. But this is yet another, whoops, yet another reason that it's nice to have Goron Mask here. Very quick for moving around this race. In that room we did some flame skips, which is pretty nice, allows us to traverse the room quickly. And that's just rolling through the flames before the flames have time to come up and have collision. This is one of those rooms I was talking about with risky strats. It's possible to actually do this room without uh, turning the flames off. but. It's such a big time loss to fail this race, it's really not worth it. Alright, time to receive a reward, the Mask of Sense, which we will never use. Not even once. And now we truly begin to prepare to enter Great Bay Temple. Soaring off to Great Bay, the biggest thing that we have to do before entering Great Bay Temple is retrieve the rest of the Zora eggs to get New Wave Bossa Nova, the song that will allow us to get in. We've got three eggs to retrieve in Pinnacle Rock, and three others left in Pirate's Fortress. We're gonna go to Pinnacle Rock first. As I mentioned earlier, doing dolphin dives like this are the fastest way to swim as Zora. And so in this next area, even though there are a bunch of invisible void planes that usually the seahorse would guide you through, I'm just going to attempt a dolphin dive all the way through them, following the path, just uh, by memorization. For my rough timing a little bit ago, that saves something like 8 to 10 seconds over swimming underwater and following the signs, and certainly saves even more time over actually dropping the seahorse. As I mentioned before, there are only three eggs here, but eight eels. We still need to kill all of the eels in order to get the seahorse heart piece.
To make our way back out, instead of following that circuitous path we took to get here, we can just void out, and that'll bring us back to the beginning of the area. Speaking of which, we will also void out right here. It is... it takes approximately the same amount of time to void here, return to shore, and then uh, go to the marine lab as it does to swim straight from Pinnacle Rock here, and this is a little nicer for lining up with the ladder. Once again, we'll get this wall rubbing jump. I do allow a slight delay between the cutscene of one egg falling ending and pressing the bottle button to drop the next egg because mashing out of the cutscene will result in Link showing the egg to the camera as though the egg cannot be dropped here. Now we are off to get the final three eggs to make the full seven. We're gonna get them in Pirate's Fortress, and this will be our last trip there. Once again, dolphin diving over. And to get past the pirates as we get in, we'll have to be somewhat quick and curve around to the left side, otherwise we'll get caught. Here, since we already have the hookshot, we will just hookshot our way in instead of going through the whole sewers again. And to get to each of these three eggs, we're actually going to do something kind of interesting. Here, we're first going to hookshot up to the target. We're going to set up an angle and then use jump slash recoil to get down to this door which skips the pirate fight that usually guards this, uh, this egg. Next we'll make our way over to the central room, and again we're going to skip a pirate fight by entering from this side. It turns out you can just barely make a jump here if you curve it to the right. And finally, we're going to do, I think, what is the most interesting of these. I'm going to exploit the fact that the pirates will only catch Link if they hear him walking by simply rolling and side hopping past this one here. Easy as that. We do have Stone Mask here, by the way. It would be free to just put on Stone Mask and walk right by the guard, but it is an extra equip, so it is a bit slower. And this guard fight goes by, well, there we go, goes by pretty quickly at least, with Gilded Sword. Here I'm going to try to get into the tank on the left side so that the fish doesn't bother me. 
but I think I missed the bottle swipe a few times here. Yeah. Oh boy. Alright, three eggs down, we just need to go deposit them and then get the song. As I mentioned earlier, we will only play this song once, following playing it right now, just to get into the dungeon. We've got just a little bit left to do before we can enter the dungeon, though. We have some things to do in Zora Hall. Namely, we're going to continue the title deed trading quest, as well as getting the heart piece in that room, and getting a second heart piece from um, Evan's room. <laughs> that was some interesting movement. Just like two of the other title deed flowers that we got access to, we really don't need this flower in order to get that heart piece. We're going to use yet another pop-up to get up to this one.
And in this room, we play a song for Evan, who will then give us a heart piece. Casually, you're meant to read this song off of a notebook in another room in Zora Cape, or Zora Hall, rather, but it's the same every time, so you can just memorize it. Finally, we are ready to exit through the back door and get ready to enter Great Bay Temple. There are a few longish cutscenes, though, on the way there. Don't worry, I'll hit that owl statue later. We don't need to be human here, so it's not really worth transforming just to hit it. But we will be human. Uh, immediately after finishing the dungeon, so we'll do it then. Great Bay is, to me, the best dungeon in this run. It is just action-packed, every single room, not too many cutscenes to watch through, and it is pretty challenging. There's a lot of cool stuff that goes into this dungeon. Very first thing, we're just going to get the fairy in this room by lighting all the torches. I want to go ahead and start describing the next room because a lot happens all at once. Uh, we're going to use a bomb chew to blow up a fairy bubble that's beneath the platform we start on. We're going to kill a Skultula for another fairy um, with a fire arrow. And then we're going to set up and roll across the room as Goron in a very unintended way and get on top of that water wheel that Tattle just mentioned. And this saves us from having to go across the room as Zora and turn one of the turn keys, which activates a somewhat long cutscene. Yeah, 
And we made it. Down here we can do a somewhat high dolphin dive out of the water to make it up to this platform that you normally couldn't reach out of the water. And let's do a little setup here to bonk our way over to this turnkey. Which is very nice, being able to get here without ice arrows. Speaking of not using ice arrows, rather than freezing that choo-choo with ice arrows and then using it to climb on to get up here, we're just going to do a gainer. This is only kind of a sequence break, it's essentially just skipping some backtracking that you'd normally have to do in the dungeon. Next we're gonna go get another fairy. And in this room I'll be aiming for the low parts of the babas that are hanging from the lily pads. Uh, aiming above that will not actually kill them, but knock them to the ground, which is very irksome. But we'll set up here, and we'll just kind of swim our way up to this ledge. Unfortunately, the fairies can sometimes get away from you. Uh, if you open a fairy chest as human form, then it'll auto-collect the fairy, but as any other form, you might have to chase it around a bit. Now this chew, this real bomb chew, can be kind of annoying, so I just went ahead and disposed of it. the one small key we need, and then we'll be on our way to Wart. Whoops, there we go. Now by lining up the swim correctly, I should be able to bonk out onto this red pipe, which will save me a couple of just surfacing animations. There we go. And the Wart fight is a kind of interesting one. Casually, what I think you're expected to do is to shoot the bubbles that are surrounding Wart's eye, and then to shoot the eye from across the room when it's open. But that's kind of slow, and um, we like to go fast. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to pull bombs at specific times, going to be listening to the, to the in-game music, and those bombs will hit Wart's eye through the pink bubbles when the eye is open. That'll knock it down, and then we'll just use the Gilded Sword with uh, Great Spin to kill it afterwards. Now I'm actually going to do something kind of neat here. I'm going to throw this bomb, and then immediately start pulling some more bombs that will explode because of the first bomb's explosion. And that actually hit work twice. Normally you'd have to use three bombs, or kind of go through three cycles to knock it down, but I knocked it down in only two. This fight is actually pretty scary in an any percent category because you have much lower health, but since this is 100%, I can just stand here and take all the hits I want. Here is our dungeon item, the ice arrows. We'll use these a few times in the run. Notably, in the next room.
As I mentioned before, when collecting fairies as forms other than human, the fairies will sometimes get away. Thankfully that one came to me quickly enough, but that one can really take a while sometimes. I'm having some trouble getting out, I guess. Oh no. There we go. In this room here, there's a turnkey on the green platform, and I think the intent is to get there with ice arrows, but we're just not going to use those. We're going to get up here to get the ferry, and then we're going to use the jump slash recoil to get to that platform. And now we finally go back to the beginning of the dungeon so that we can turn the water wheel around. That'll allow us to access all the remaining rooms in the dungeon. There's a very cool trick here. I think I missed in this run. I think I bonk here. Yeah, it's kind of a tight frame window to get a good jump out of that small dive, but you can get a jump onto this platform and start turning without bonking and without climbing. Now, as we've done in Dungeons in the past, we're just going to conveniently void here as Goron so that we don't need to make our way all the way back up to where we started. And now we can begin going through the other parts of the dungeon. First up, we're going to go back to a room we visited before, and we're going to get the boss key early by doing a setup with a jump here. We could have done that with ice arrows too, but it's a bit slower. And even though we already have the key, which is kind of supposed to be the reward for uh, getting over here and defeating this mini-boss, Gecko, we need to come in this room anyway to collect the frog that spawns when Gecko is defeated, uh, so that we can get Don Giro's heart piece later. second cycle, I'm going to try to manipulate Gecko to move towards the door by letting him hop a little bit to the left and then back to the right. Didn't get him as close to the door as I wanted, but it was pretty close. If you let him go straight to the right first, he goes past the door and you can get him right in front of the door, but not this time. Next, we get a pretty cool trick. In this next room, again, we're supposed to use some ice arrows for stuff, and I don't want to. So I'm just going to do a bounce off the floor here and make my way onto yet another water wheel. Ride that all the way to the door. 
Now there are some fairies in this room that I need to come back and get, but I'm going to leave the room and enter it from this side so that after I collect the fairies I can just void and spawn back at this door, rather than spawning back at my previous entrance point. In this next room, I'm going to immediately pull a chew so I can break a barrel that contains a fairy. Thankfully, the angle we get from opening this door is perfectly in line with that barrel, as long as I walk over to here. Next, we're going to skip using fire and ice arrows uh, for this, just by doing a jump slash over here. Unfortunately, the fairy got stuck under that platform, so I'm going to have to free it by entering this cutscene. Thankfully, I don't have to go all the way over to it but usually it'll come straight to me, um, even before the cutscene. This is the second to last turn key we need to push in order to get to the boss door. Now we're gonna just dispose of this real bomb chew because it's really awful. And then we're going to skip using the hookshot to get across this gap by just walking across. Oh, missed the fairy. There we go. Oh no. I'm trying to jump onto the chest to get a jump to the fence. There we go. Oh boy. Camera angles are tough. And now we approach the Gyrog fight. This is kind of a tense part of the run because in-game time is very tight here. We're going to play Song of Double Time to advance to Night of Day 3 so that we can time getting to Sakon's hideout right before 7. But before we do that, we need to defeat Gyrog, the boss. And we need to do... what do we need to do? We need to get our fairy reward, and we need to go get the Keaton mask and the priority mail from the Curiosity Shop Man. So, once I play Song of Double Time here, any mistakes can be fatal to the run. Or at least make me have to reroute quite a bit. Speaking of being tight on time, it's possible to jump on this little water platform right now without waiting a cycle, but it's a little tight and if I failed it, then I would probably end up losing the run, or losing a lot of time. Now the strat for Gyorg is pretty similar to how you would do it casually, though we employ a stun lock. I'm going to shoot Gyorg to stun it, and then as Zora, I'm going to put up my magic barrier to damage it. But as it tries to swim away from being damaged, I will continue hitting it and stun it again. So we'll get through the first three cycles of phase one immediately. And then we're just going to do the exact same thing for phase two, but there are only two cycles to get through. This is a little bit different on the Japanese version, because on the Japanese version of the game, Zorlink can't use the magic barrier when he's not swimming, and we're trying to use it here while just sinking and rising. So on the Japanese version, you kind of have to do some weird wiggling against Gyorg, and it at least looks a little bit harder. And there's 
is our guy orc fight. The in-game time, as you can see, is just before 6.30, so we should have time to go to that fairy fountain and then get the things from the curiosity shop back room and make it a sack on side out in time. Here we are back at the owl statue as human this time, so we'll activate it now. Interestingly, we have to activate this owl for completing 100% of the game, but we're never actually going to soar back to it. There's no reason to ever come back here. And so now we'll just grab this high ledge by transforming into Zora right next to it. Easy exploit. And here we give up the Great Bay Fairies to get double defense. I mentioned before that this cycle, cycle 2, lasts for over 3 hours of the run. And all the things we're going to do within the next half hour or so are completing story arcs and completing side quests, things that rely on earlier things we've done this cycle. Meaning that mistakes around this part of the run can be really terrifying if I miss, for example, getting to Sakon's hideout on time. I have to add an entire extra cycle just to complete the Anju Cafe side quest again. Thankfully the route is relatively safe, so that's a pretty uncommon occurrence, but learning this category for the first time can really be brutal around this part of the run. Missing something costs tens of minutes. Here we get the priority mail and the Keaton mask. This is most of the way through the Andrew Cafe side quest. And we're actually going to do this much of the Andrew Cafe side quest again in cycle 4, because the priority mail that we just got is actually used for two different things in 100%. We need to use it to get the bottle of Chateau Romani, and we need to use it to get the postman's hat, and it's not possible to do that on the same cycle without glitches. This cycle, however, we are going to take the Andrew Cafe side quest to completion. We're going to go to Sakon's hideout, retrieve the sun mask, and eventually get the couple's mask. Now for making it to Sakon's hideout, all we need to do is to get to this area after that little black load zone, or semi-load zone, by 7pm in game time. We made it with time to spare, I like to play this part pretty safe just because it is absolutely a run ender to miss Sakon here. Thank <laughs> you. 
Now this is a terribly stressful in-game event when playing casually, but if you go into Sakon's hideout already knowing all of the puzzles and which enemies will spawn, and having the Gilded Sword, it goes by pretty quickly. Upon exiting Sakon's hideout, the in-game time will advance automatically to midnight of the final day, meaning we have six in-game hours left to do some things. And boy do we have some things to do. We've got to finish up the trading sequence, the title deed trading sequence, which we'll do momentarily with that Deku business scrub that is on screen. We'll get that heart piece, and that'll work nicely into our rupee routing. We're going to spend quite a few rupees here. We also are going to get both of our bomb bag upgrades, do two mini games, get a heart piece, um, what, get the Dampe Big Po bottle, we're gonna get the mirror shield, we're gonna get Elegy of Emptiness, all of this within the upcoming six hours of in-game time. We could fly back from this ledge as Deku, but it is slightly faster to void as Goron, bringing us back to the opposite ledge. Our next stop is the Night 3 Grave, which contains Dampe and the Big Po fight, from which we'll get a bottle. Dampe and Majora's Mask can either be good or bad, fast or slow. The object is to get him to dig up the three dig spots that contain the Po's soul, the blue flame. And there are, I believe, six dig spots in the room total, but only four of the dig spots can possibly contain the blue flame. So we need to guess among those four dig spots in order to find the three flames. As far as I know, each of those four dig spots is equally likely to contain the flames, so there is a 75% chance that we will need to dig up all four of them in order to find the three flames. Meaning that a time loss to Dampe is expected every run. There's a pesky wall master to dispose of here. And we get some nice rupees too. With my rupee count, I really didn't need those, but I will need to collect the purple rupee that's in the back of the room while Dampe is riding the elevator. Yeah. 
And unfortunately no flame here, so I will be getting bad Dampe. Need to go bring him across the room again in order to dig up the fourth spot. It's kind of hard to explain, but because of some in-game time events that we need to do before the end of this cycle, it's a little bit less awkward to run the route having gotten bad Dampe luck like I just did, than having gotten good Dampe luck. Uh, essentially what it boils down to is having good Dampe luck, it is possible to complete everything in the route that we need to do here before obtaining the Postman's Hat, but any uncleanliness in gameplay can make that impossible and will force a reroute forcing you to either soar extra times or and or uh, invert and uninvert time extra times which while that would still be faster than getting bad damp a luck it would negate some of that time save now in the big poe fight i am going to be going for some one frame shots i think i get some yeah there's that spinning animation that we see here, and then there's one frame of vulnerability, much like the Wizrobes had, between that ending and a that spinning attack beginning. If I shoot the arrow too early, it'll just go through the Poe, and if I shoot it too late, it'll clank right off the Poe. On this last cycle, I didn't go for one of those one framers, because this is the last cycle on the Poe, it just died. And we need to collect its soul after the fight, but unfortunately, the Poe Soul likes to land out of bounds with the slightest provocation. And I noticed that the Poe was kind of half in bounds, half out of bounds where it spawned on that last time. Didn't want to take the risk. So I let it fly to a clearly in bounds part of the room. There is not really a good backup for failing to obtain this big Poe Soul, which we'll need in Beneath the Well. Next we're off to bring the priority mail to the postman, which starts the sequence that'll allow us to get the postman's hat at the end of this cycle. Next we're going to obtain one of the bomb bags. Because we did not save Grandma from being robbed by Sakon on night one of this cycle, the bomb bag upgrade is here in the shop and we're just going to buy it. We will save Grandma next time. Next we're off to the swamp to do a little bit of cleanup. We're going to do the witch archery minigame, which can only be completed on the cycle where Kume has been saved and Adolwa has been defeated. The swamp has been purified. We're also going to buy another bomb bag upgrade and collect the last frog for Don Giro's heart piece. This is the least stressful of the archery minigames in this run, or in this game, I, I suppose. In this archery minigame, we have to hit 20 or more targets while hitting Kume with fewer than 10 arrows, and we have ample time to do this. I will just hit 20 targets and then face the camera down so as to reduce lag. Now 
Now, unfortunately, we do have to sit through the remainder of the duration of this minigame, despite not shooting any arrows and having reached our goal of 20 hits already. Next is our final bomb bag upgrade, which we'll buy from this scrub. Normally the Deku scrub that sells the bomb bag is in Snowhead, but because we've completed the title deed trading sequence this cycle, that Snowhead business scrub is now in Woodfall. And our last order of business for the swamp is collecting this frog. This is the final frog we need to collect for the Don Giro heart piece, so we're just going to soar to Mountain Village and collect that heart piece now. Similarly to how the Witch Archery minigame was only possible on a cycle when Adolwa had been defeated, we have a Fisherman minigame to complete that is only possible on a cycle when Gyorg has been defeated. There's no reason to defeat Gyorg again, so we've got to get that done at the end of this cycle. The intended way of getting to the platform to start the fisherman minigame is to ride the canoe that's here, but that's pretty slow, so we're just going to fire some ice arrows, doing some pretty precise shots, and we're going to be able to hookshot our way onto that tree. I think this platform is a little too far away, yeah, so I'm gonna shoot another one. This part of the run is a fan favorite because the moon is crashing, the world is ending, and we get to hear some fun minigame music. Thank <laughs> you. 
Much like the Witch Archery minigame we completed just a few minutes ago, the goal of this minigame is to get 20 points, and then we just need to wait out the rest of the timer. We have two final bits of business here. One is to collect a fish, again for Beneath the Well, which we've been subtly collecting all of the items we need for uh, over the past... actually over the past hour, I suppose. And to get the heart piece that is up on the cliff above. This is the one magic bean that we will plant in the run. The remaining five are for beneath the well. The intended way to get over to the heart piece on the next ledge is to call the Scarecrow from here. And we do have Scarecrow song, but it's pretty slow to call the Scarecrow, watch it spawn, and then hookshot over. So we'll just do a jump as Zora. Now we're off to Akana. As I mentioned before, we actually have quite a bit to do here. We want to get Elegy of Emptiness from Castle of Akana to prepare for completing Stone Tower Temple next cycle. And to do that, we're going to need to get the Mirror Shield from Beneath the Well, which will require the Gibdo Mask from Pamela's House, which we are getting right now. The upcoming animation of Link being really surprised while wearing the Stone Mask is one of my favorites in the run. Note that we do have less than two hours of in-game time left at this point, and still quite a few things to do. I seem to be having some trouble finding the well. There we go. Now again, over the course of the past hour or so, we've gotten all the things we need in order to complete beneath the well. All we need to do is go through it and give the items to the Gibdos. Oh, 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 oh. 
And when we open this chest, we'll have the mirror shield. With that, we'll have everything we need in order to complete Castle of Vakana and get the Elegy of Emptiness. And casually, the intent here is for the player to shine light on the sun icon that's on the wall and spawn a ladder to be able to make it into Castle of Vakana from below. But climbing up there is really slow, and we have some other stuff we need to do anyway, so we're just going to soar away. We have two things in Clock Town to wrap up before the in-game timer reaches one hour remaining. We need to get the Postman's Hat, which we'll do first. We have plenty of time, I think. And then we're going to finish the Andrew Cafe side quest and receive the couple's mask. Finally, we're going to make our way back to Akana to complete Akana Castle, obtain Elegy of Emptiness, and finally finish Cycle 2, which has lasted us... wow, it's almost four hours. One unfortunate thing about Akana Castle in this run is that to enter it, rather than completing the puzzle and shining light on this block, we're just going to do a gainer to get on top of the block and jump over here. This, uh, the unfortunate part of this is that this skips the intro cutscene for uh, Akana Castle, which obviously is good for a speedrun, we want to save time, but it means that the music never begins, so we never get to hear the Akana Castle music. Here, rather than completing this puzzle, we're just going to get on top of the lava ceiling thing. And make our way over to the switch, very clumsily.
Here we'll finally use the keg that we bought something like two hours ago to blow up the ceiling and shine light on the bottom floor. And then again, we're going to be skipping a puzzle here to get the heart piece. Instead of hitting the switch and flying over with Deku flowers, we're just going to use a bomb boost to get up onto this fence and then do a terrifying side hop over to the heart piece. Never mind the red flashing number on the bottom of the screen, everything is fine. And now, with 44 minutes left on the in-game clock, the only thing we have remaining to do is to defeat Ego's Duokana and his henchmen, and obtain the Elegy of Emptiness. Thankfully, with the Gilded Sword, this fight goes very quickly. Unfortunately, we don't get to listen to the very end of this excellent and dramatic rendition of Elegy of Emptiness because we're going to cut it off with the Song of Time, finally ending Cycle 2. Now we've got two more cycles to do this run, Cycles 3 and 4, and in those we only have one more dungeon to complete, Stone Tower Temple, and then of course the moon, but we do have quite a bit of cleanup to do in terms of mini games and side quests going to complete a good chunk of that first, this cycle, and then go on to Stone Tower. Now one thing we want to do this cycle is to save the old bomb bag lady from Sakon so that we can get the Blast Mask, and we're going to play the Song of Double Time shortly, as soon as I reach this door up here. 
to give us just the right amount of in-game time to do all the other things we want to do before saving the bomb bag lady, which will happen at 12.20 in-game time. As a result of that, any mistakes in the upcoming sequence of side quest events and mini games can be pretty costly. First on our to-do list is use our newly obtained couple's mask to get the heart piece from Mayor Dotor. One fun thing to listen for here is the dramatic music in his office changing to the normal Zelda house music when taking off the transformation mask. Next on our to-do list is to teabag the door several times, and then go set the midnight meeting with Andrew. Again, we are going to be completing the midnight meeting on this cycle and the next cycle. Now it's back to our very convenient 100 rupee chest in preparation for many games we need to pay for. And now Town Archery. This archery minigame is significantly more stressful than the Witch Archery minigame we played earlier, just because, as I mentioned before, we're on a strict in-game timer for this whole sequence, and it's just a bit harder. Oh my. We are going to have to complete this minigame two times, first to win the large quiver and second to obtain the heart piece. And I'm actually going to hit some of the blue octos here, as you can see intentionally to run down the timer for the minigame a little bit more quickly. I need to hit 40 red octos before the timer runs out, and each time I hit a blue octo, the timer, uh, or three seconds are subtracted from the timer. So the goal is going to be to hit the 40th red octo and then almost immediately run out of time. Now to obtain the heart piece, I'm going to have to hit all 50 red octos, no mistakes, no hitting blue octos, no missing. Which is a bit stressful. Perfect. We have just three things left to do before we go save the bomb bag lady. First, we're going to go to West Clocktown and complete the Postman mini game. Then we're going to go to the Sword School, and then we're going to complete the Bio Baba Grotto. Now the object of the Postman minigame is to press A when the Postman has counted to 10. 
his timer for counting to 10 only shows up on screen for the entire duration of the minigame if Link is wearing the bunny hood, but that would have been an extra equip. So instead, I'm just going to use a visual cue in order to press A at the right time. This minigame is significantly harder on the Japanese version of the game, which makes running this on English pretty nice. The A press just has to be timed much more precisely on the Japanese version of the game. This minigame is pretty much an auto-scroller, but I have failed it before. You'll notice that as Link targets one of the logs, he doesn't immediately turn to face it. He takes a split second, and by pressing A to do a jump slash before Link makes that little turn, Link will actually miss the log with his jump slash. Very unfortunate to lose time to this one, but we nailed it this time. Last stop is this bio Baba Grotto. I'll enter as Zora just to prepare my position. And I've got to be somewhat quick in getting this heart piece because the in-game time is nearing 11.45. We need to be back in North Clock Town by 12.20 or so. And not saving Grandma this cycle would be a pretty bad time loss. We don't really need the Blast Mask to use for anything, but we do need to obtain it for 100% obviously. So failing this would require resetting the cycle an extra time. To get out of the grotto quickly, I avoided as Goron so that the game brought me back to this exit from Clocktown. I'll now roll around Termina Field to get to North Clocktown, just in time to save the bomb bag lady. I actually have three other things to do here while I'm saving her. I'm going to get this heart piece from the post box using the postman's hat that I got at the end of last cycle. Then I will wait, but after this cutscene, and before Sakon leaves the area, I'm going to try to get the heart piece that's visible in the tree in the bottom right right now, and complete the Keaton quiz. Now that that sequence is complete, we don't really need to worry about in-game time for most of the rest of this cycle. Now we're just going to head over to the inn, gain her inn like we did earlier, and meet Andrew for the midnight meeting. We did this last cycle to begin the Andrew Cafe side quest, but this cycle we're going to spend most of our time in Stone Tower, so we won't really be able to do the full side quest. So we're just going to give this nice heartfelt letter to the Toilet Hand to use for its uh, purposes.
Amazing. Now in glitch runs, there are some pretty cool ways to ascend Stone Tower without playing Elegy very much. However, we can't use any of those here, so I am about to play Elegy of Emptiness uh, what feels like 20 times, but is probably more like 5. There is a little bit of cheesing we can do, though, by riding around on the blocks by playing Elegy on top of them, uh, rather than pressing down on all of the switches. Here I can make a quick cycle with these rocks if I aim quickly. Let's see if I can get past this one. Yep, made it before that rock. Interestingly, it is possible to hookshot onto the eye of the Beemos here, rather than using the hookshot target that is right next to it. This is very slightly faster as it is closer to the switch. Here we're going to go for a ride. We got this block down here for us, and when we play Elegy now, our statue will appear on this block with us and move off of the switch that brought this block down here, making the block go back up where it came from, and bringing us to the next area. This is yet another owl statue that we will activate because we're 100%ing the game, but we'll never actually soar to. And now we enter Stone Tower Temple. This run has quite a few mistakes in Stone Tower Temple, so we'll get to see some of these tricks um, more than is really desirable. With good RNG, the bomb shoes in this room can be really useful. They'll blow up this wall for us and blow up the floor in the next area for us if we're careful. And that'll save us a little time over doing an extra equip to put bombs on our C buttons.
think the bomb twos are going to hit each other. Yeah, that's too bad. So I'll have to equip bombs here. Speaking of the blast mask earlier, I did once find myself here without any bombs, and eventually figured out that I should just use the blast mask. Finally got some use out of that thing. In this next room, we're going to try to bonk off of the floor as Zora in order to get a nice jump up to this platform. There are other ways of backing that up, including doing a ledge grab by transforming to Zora while swimming up against the ledge, and getting that Dexy hand we see on the left to throw us up here. But that was the fastest way. Hopefully I'll get it on the way back as well. And here we have another gainer over a sunblock, very useful. This is actually a pretty nice sequence break because this dungeon is designed to make the player backtrack quite a bit in order to get fairies. Uh, that one would normally require having the light arrows, which I don't have yet. And in fact, we will still have to do a little bit of backtracking after we invert stone tower. We'll have to flip it over again to get two final fairies but we can take care of most of the fairies in one pass. This room is torture without stone mask, but thankfully we do have stone mask here and it is absolutely worth equipping, despite the fact that Lichel's any percent has to do this room without stone mask. Unfortunately, I did mess up shining the light on the mirrors, so I'll have to do that a second time. Mirror shield controls are pretty finicky. Among the other things we need to do in this dungeon, defeating the boss, getting the light arrows, and collecting all the fairies, we actually do want to make it up to 500 rupees while we're in this dungeon, filling our wallet, so that we can buy the all night mask as soon as we get out. So I will be collecting some rupees on this ledge, and then later I'll be farming some rupees from the bubbles before Gomez. One kind of interesting thing in this room is that I'm going to avoid that vent just to the right of me, and swing around this corner in kind of a tight loop and get blown up by the bomb chew. Let's try that again. <laughs> 
Alright, next time I'm also going to avoid that vent. And the reason I want to do that is that when flying with flowers as Deku, the distance you can go is determined by how far you are from the original place you started flying. And that corner is not actually far enough from the first vent to force Deku to fall, and when we round the corner we're getting closer to the vent. So we can make it all the way to the third vent without ever having hit the second, and it's just a more direct path. I remember this Garrow Master fight being rather rough as well. The strat for Garrow Master is to roll into him while he is attempting to hit you with his swords. Oh my. So the way it usually works is you roll into him while he's swinging his swords just like that, and your invincibility frames during the roll prevent him from hitting you. I'm having some trouble here just with my positioning. And you gotta be kinda quick on the jump slash in order to hit him. Oh no. Yep. Oh. Unfortunately I got bad RNG there. I only needed one more hit on him, but he rose up and cost me a little extra time. Fortunately, there are two other Garrow Master fights in the run, where I will have an opportunity to show off that strat once more. Unfortunately, I believe they both went poorly this run. So, we'll see. This room's a bit tricky. I'm going to first throw a bomb at such an angle that it bounces off the wall and lands pretty close to the switch that is on the underside of the platform, which will allow me to get this fairy chest now instead of doing it after having inverted. Then I've got to hookshot my way up and get back past that hip loop to the door, and it's harder than it looks. Some nice jump slash recoil to make it up to this platform without climbing. And now, for the most hilarious mini-boss fight of the run. I find that it is all the funnier for having the bunny hood on. As I mentioned before, Stone Tower Temple is one of the few places where we'll use bunny hood. The other two I can think of being Secret Shrine and the Moon. Just because we do need to be human for a lot of this dungeon in order to be firing arrows. Sometimes the dragonflies here like to sacrifice themselves to force me to lose time. That one almost did. And now it is time to flip the dungeon to complete the other half of it. I'm going to play Elegy on this one switch to move this one block out of the way, then fire a light arrow at the medallion and we'll enter Inverted Stone Tower Temple. In one of the most thrilling and engaging sequences of the run, I am going to hold up notch on my controller for the next 30 seconds or so. Don't worry, I wasn't exaggerating, I still get to hold up notch here. Now, when we're done with this dungeon, we're going to want it to be past midnight on the night of the final day, 
because we're going to want to get both Kamaro's mask and the all night mask from the curiosity shop. So before I unequip Ocarina in this room, I'm going to play Song of Double Time three times in order to advance to Night of the Final Day. And then the remainder of my time in this dungeon will help me advance the time to beyond midnight where I need it to be. Unfortunately, it looks like I missed that vent dive. That's kind of strange. Now to make it to the next fairy chest, which is in an alcove... <laughs> nice. An alcove underneath this bridge, I'm going to do a curved jump. It's an oddly precise one, but has a reasonable backup. And finally going to unequip Ocarina. There is a small key chest available in this room by pressing a switch that we're going to pass momentarily, but I'm going to skip it because I won't need it with this sequence break that I'm about to attempt and fail. It is possible to jump past this Dexy hand and land on a lower platform without voiding, however, I think I'm going to miss it here. Yeah, I'm fairly certain I missed this a second time as well, so we'll get to see the setup for this trick three times. Just a little bonus content. Approaching Gomez, the mini boss that guards the boss key. On the way there, we're going to collect some purple rupees from these bubbles because, again, we do need to get up to 500 rupees by the end of the dungeon. This mini boss fight will go by pretty quickly with Gilded Sword. It's just going to be a matter of shooting a light arrow and doing a jump slash four times. Now, since the bubbles in this hallway respawn every time you enter the hallway and are very convenient, we're actually going to kill them a couple more times to fill our wallet. But before the next time we do, we're going to do a trick called Early Igor, which is a pretty cool one. It's some oddly precise arrow shots on this Igor up on this high platform, not really supposed to be able to access yet. And doing this 
both unlocks the door up there that we'll need in order to get to the boss room, and spawns the giant's mask chest, which will be useful for a couple of reasons. One, of course, we need the giant's mask for 100%, and two, we'll be able to hookshot to that chest, which skips some rooms of the dungeon and just saves us a bit of time. In the next room we'll see our third whiz rope fight of the run. We had two in Snowhead Temple. We've got one here and then we'll have one later in Secret Shrine. And just as in Snowhead Temple where we would do combos to hit the whiz rope on its one frame of vulnerability, we're going to try to do that here, but it's a bit more awkward because we're trying to use light arrows to damage the whiz rope. Before we were using Goron Pounds and Punches, whose hurt boxes last for many frames. But using light arrows, the hurt boxes pass through the whiz rope very quickly, so it's a bit more precise. I believe I miss it here. Unfortunately, just a little bit early, so we will have to watch this cutscene for the first time in the run. And then fight the whiz rope casually. The last thing we'll need to do before entering the boss fight is to spawn a chest that we'll have to come back and get once we've flipped Stone Tower Temple over again. And I'm going to do an awkward jump back to the platform I came from <laughs> out of this cutscene. It looks pretty scary because there's a possibility of falling into the sky, but fortunately voiding there just brings us back to the door anyway, it's just a little bit slower. Now, this is a somewhat precise hookshot to reach this chest, but it is possible. And I mentioned before that we need the giant's mask for 100%, and we need this chest in order to get up here quickly, skipping part of the dungeon. We are not actually going to use the giant's mask, because it is kind of slow as a method of defeating Twin Mold. Instead, we're going to defeat Twin Mold using bombs, fire arrows, and ice arrows, as I will describe momentarily. The Twin Mold fight is really designed for Link to be huge and wearing the giant's mask, which is why there are magic drops all over the place. But we're not going to do that, it's pretty slow, giant's mask doesn't deal very much damage and we would have to watch some cutscenes for putting on the giant's mask and taking it back off. So straight out of the cutscene here, we're going to throw a bomb to damage Twin Mold's tail, and hit it with a fire arrow as well. The Twin Molds actually have type weaknesses. Fire arrows deal double damage to the blue one, and ice arrows deal double damage to the red one. So, if I can stop getting wrecked here, there we go, then I'll be able to defeat the blue one in just one more fire arrow shot. We'll take the one bomb and three fire arrow shots, and then the red one will take a total of four ice arrow shots. I'm getting some pretty aggressive RNG here. There we go.
A lot of Majora's Mask runners make this fight look pretty easy, and I've even done so myself before, but make no mistake, it is as hard as it looks right now. that, we have... oh no. <laughs> We've ringed around the rosy. Uh, with that, we have completed all four of the dungeons in the game. But again, we have quite a bit of cleanup left to do. First thing we're going to do is actually finish getting all of the fairies in Stone Tower Temple, as we've only been able to get 13 of the 15 so far. And that way we'll be able to get the reward, the Great Fairy Sword. Then we have a few more things to complete this cycle. And then a nice hour-long cycle of mini-games and general cleanup after that. On this light arrow shot that will invert Stone Tower Temple once again, I'm going to take my time using a visual cue on the HUD to get it right because missing that too many times and running out of magic is a humongous time loss. Absolutely worth taking the time on that one. I'm going to kill this dragonfly, though I think it's going to take me a few arrows because it's not noticing me. There we go. Just because that dragonfly will reliably mess with Link as he tries to climb the ladder out of this pit. Here we finally come back for the compass. We were in this room before, but it would have been inconvenient to come all the way over to this side of it. So we left it for here because we have to come in and get the ferry that's underwater anyway.
Finally leaving the dungeon, we are going to pick up some supplies here. I do need both magic and arrows in preparation for some rupee farming that we're going to do before the end of the cycle. And this is how you get down Stone Tower quickly. Very satisfying to land that one. With the Great Fairy Sword, we have now received all of the fairy rewards from the four dungeons. Okay, as I mentioned before, before the end of this cycle, we do want to obtain the All Night Mask, which we can only get from the Curiosity Shop on the night of the final day past 10pm. On the cycle, we've saved the bomb bag lady, which we did at the beginning of this cycle. So we're going to take advantage of that now. But before we do, we're also going to get the Kamara mask, so we're actually going to deposit these 500 rupees that we obtained in Stone Tower Temple. And while we're out in North Termina Field getting the Kamara mask, we will farm some more rupees from the Enos before we go back to Curiosity Shop to buy the All Nine mask. Once again, we will need to deposit 5,000 rupees by the end of the run in order to obtain the bank card piece. Now begins our first round of real rupee farming. The Enos, these snowman enemies in North Termina Field, same places and hang out around the same places, so there is a general path that I follow to collect 500 rupees as quickly as possible. Speaking of as quickly as possible, this is one of the other times in the run we get to wear the bunny hood. I had forgotten to mention this one before. Because of how rough my stone tower was, I actually am playing it pretty close on endgame time here. If there were less than one hour left on the in-game clock, then I could not enter the curiosity shop to buy the all night mask. So that was a pretty close one. And already I'm going to go ahead and end cycle 3. In comparison to cycle 2, there was not too much to do this cycle. I have to say I am pretty proud of myself for remembering to play the correct song here. I usually end up playing the Song of Soaring by accident, which is a song I play from this very step earlier on in the run when collecting the bomb bags. In a run this long, where we visit all of our locations so many different times, it can be easy to mix things up. Our final cycle is mostly dedicated to mini-games. There are some mini-games that we're going to need to complete on all three days of this cycle, namely Deku Playground and Honey and Darling, in order to obtain their heart pieces, and then there are some other ones that we'll collect along the way too. 
First, once again, we need to set the midnight meeting, and we have the all night's mask, so we're going to advance time to the point in the day where we can set the midnight meeting by talking to Grandma down here and obtaining the first of two heart pieces from her by advancing time two hours at a time. We'll need to do this three more times in order to advance time past 1.15 p.m. to set the midnight meeting. While we're here, we're also going to get the room key for the first time, just to make it convenient to enter the in later times in this cycle. Here is the final gainer in the run. And now we're off to our mini games. First, we enter Honey and Darling Day One, which is the Bomb Chew mini game. I essentially play this casually, though. Right off the bat, there are two targets that we can easily hit, one by flipping 180 degrees, and the other by just holding up left notch. I am shield dropping these bomb chews in order to be able to release more of them at once than is really intended. Next up is Chest Minigame, which is an unfortunately RNG heavy minigame five hours into the run. And in this run, I managed to take three tries to get this heart piece at the end of the minigame, which is a large and unfortunate time loss. This maze is randomly generated for each iteration of the minigame, and the camera does not help us make it through. Sometimes chess minigame is very nice and gives you the path straight away, and sometimes it does not. Notably, there are ways to cheat this minigame, none of which are allowed in Glitchless, uh, but they happen sometimes accidentally anyway. Oh man, I'm trying my hardest. Um, the ways to cheat this minigame are to roll onto the corner of a platform as it rises, and to clip into a platform as it rises. Um, both of which, again, can happen by accident pretty easily. Oh, in fact, you can see me clipping into a platform right now. I have to say, this is probably the biggest downside of this category. I like a lot of things about this category, but we have to complete this minigame casually five hours into the run. And it can be a doozy.
What a nice easy mini game. <laughs> Thankfully, we've made it past it now, and we are on our way to Deku Playground 1. It's also pretty easy to cheat at this minigame in a way that is no longer allowed in Glitchless. In this minigame, there are a bunch of rupees on top of moving platforms to collect, and on days 2 and 3, some of the platforms are moving side to side. By simply doing some mask transformations in this room, it is possible to stall the rupees while the platforms keep moving, causing the rupees to all fall to the ground, and making them extremely easy to collect. Again, that is currently banned in this category and wouldn't work for day one anyway. We'll see some interesting strats on day two and three of this minigame, however, as a result of that being banned. We experienced our first rupee farming sequence a little bit earlier, but here's where we start to hit it really hard. Again, we have to get up to 5,000 rupees in the bank by the end of the run to acquire that heart piece. And now we're just going to go out and farm until we get to 500 rupees four times for a total of 2,000 in this set. Along the way here, we are also going to complete Dodongo Grotto, from which we'll get 100 rupees and heart piece. Kind of unfortunately, because our method of rupee farming here is shooting light arrows at the Enos, we will have to be farming magic and arrows throughout. And the reason that that's kind of unfortunate is that later, when we finish collecting all of the 5,000 rupees, we will have Chateau Romani, which means infinite magic, and we will have the largest quiver, which means, well, we will have gotten the largest quiver recently, meaning it'll be full, and we will have the largest quiver, meaning we can carry 50 arrows at once. So the fact that we need to farm magic and arrows here from RNG drops that can take a while is unfortunate, but we do need to pass some in-game time here just because we need to make it to the midnight meeting. We can't just advance to day two to complete those minigames. So might as well spend the time doing something useful. Here you'll notice that I'm intentionally not getting spikes while rolling as Goron, I just want to preserve magic so that I don't need to farm quite as much when I come back out here to do some more rupee farming.
On this round I actually got extraordinarily lucky and got two red ruby drops from this set of bushes. I managed to make my way all the way up to 50 rupees before even beginning to farm from the Enos, so I only had to kill 9 Enos instead of 10, and just goes to show what happens when you practice your RNG. Finally, having completed this last round of rupee farming, for now, we are preparing to do some new things. First, we will get the heart piece from the Rosa sisters using Kamara's mask. This section really highlights one of the challenges of doing a run like this. Uh, after all of that rupee farming and this far into the run, I need to remember that I don't deposit all of my rupees here, I deposit only 490 of them instead of 500. Details like this are a hidden challenge of this category, and until getting very familiar with this category and this route, I would make mistakes with things like that all the time, but being able to think ahead in the route is really the key. Anyway, we are going to use those 10 rupees to start Honey and Darling Day 2, but before we do that, before we advance to Day 2, we need to meet Andrew for the midnight meeting. Usually this would actually take place quite a bit earlier in-game time-wise, but because chess minigame was so mean to me, and we're still on that cycle, I haven't advanced time since then. 
uh, it's later in the night than usual. Next, we're going to put on our cow hat and go play some songs. Now in this sequence, we just have to play part of the song with all four of Link's transformations. And there is not too much to do here except for try not to fail the songs. However, we will do them in an optimal order. I will start as Human Link. I will then go as Zora Link to the right spotlight. And then I will do the Deku song in the left and the Goron song in the back left so that I end up as Goron and can leave the milk bar as quickly as possible. Oh no. I did the one thing you can do wrong, wrong. All of that was of course to get the circus leader's mask, which we will never use, but does complete our mask screen of the pause menu. It would be kind of hard to find a use for this mask in a speedrun. Its only function is to make the Gorman brothers not attack the jugs of milk during the escort sequence, but it's impossible to get the mask before completing that sequence since we need the Romani mask to enter the milk bar in the first place, so ultimately it's just mask menu decoration. Here we begin getting ready for day two of this cycle, and day two of this cycle is kind of an intense one in terms of in-game time. Just like some of the other tight in-game time sections of the run, there is a lot to do in this section and any mistakes can cause a lot of time loss. But unlike the first day of second cycle of the run where we did a lot of things before getting to Epona, we are playing with time uninverted here, meaning time is moving quickly. And if we ever really need to, we can just invert and usually things will work out as long as we catch it early enough. The big in-game time restriction on this cycle is that we need to get to Grandma in the inn by 6pm so that we can hear her long story to advance to day 3. And if we don't do that, then we need to add an extra cycle to the run, which would be very unfortunate. But we still want to pack in a lot of things before we get to Grandma. We've got this Honey and Darling Day 2 minigame to do, which despite what the screen insists, was not exactly perfect this run, but acceptable, I suppose. <laughs> After this, we're going to go straight to Deku Playground Day 2, which is a really cool one. Though on the way, we need to mail the letter to Cafe so that we can advance that side quest as well. Deku Playground Day 2 shows off more of the parkour I was alluding to earlier. 
casually, Deku Playground is intended to be played as Deku and using all of the flowers on the moving platforms to launch into the air and fly to the other platforms collecting all of the rupees, but that is pretty slow and routes have been devised for simply hopping between platforms. It's pretty challenging at first, just to have good depth perception in this game, but it is a learnable skill. And what I'm actually doing here, you might notice that I had the platform I was jumping to off screen for a little while. I was watching the shadow on the floor to help me time my jump. The way the shadow lines up with the blue tiles on the floor shows me exactly when I need to jump. It's convenient to have done these two minigames first because the reward for each of them is 50 rupees and we are about to go spend some rupees. We need to get the last of the overworld maps from Tingle and then we're going to complete the Swamp Archery minigame. Before we make it to Swamp Archery, however, we do need to get this heart piece from the Bad Bat Tree. Easy now that we have the Stone Mask. And we need to do one of the most infuriating things in the run. <laughs> there isn't that much in this run that is really all that grueling, but this part is. What we need to do is collect five fish here, filling all of our bottles, so that we can feed four of the fish to the fish in the marine lab tank and obtain that heart piece. As you can see though, it's not always the easiest thing to successfully get the fish into the bottle. And if the fish are slightly too far away, you get a nice long cutscene of Goron Link catching some water like this. And this is such a bad feeling. The reason that it's hard at all is that Goron Link will actually drown in this water and void out if he goes much farther in than I've gone in now. I'm actually really surprised that I didn't void out this deep. And voiding out means coming back here from the opposite end of this map, which normally is not such a big deal, it's not such a big map, but again, we're on a tight in-game timer for this uh, section of the run. Thankfully I was able to get my five fish. Technically, only four fish are really necessary to get the fish heart piece in the lab, but the fish sometimes misbehave, sometimes the wrong fish eats the fish that Link drops, so it is wise to get as many as possible. And now it's time for Swamp Archery. This minigame, just like the Town Archery minigame, is exactly the same track every time, so very practicable, no RNG. It is convenient to have gotten an RNG minigame like um, chest minigame out of the way in a section of the run where time is not quite so tight. Unlike in town archery, in the swamp archery I do need to hit all of the targets both times and there is no way to speed up the timer. Which is pretty unfortunate because the timer is going to count down completely, all the way down to zero, once I finish the minigame. And that does take some in-game time.
Having 37 seconds left on the timer is a pretty bad time for that. I was really struggling there, but I think the next time I'll do a little bit better. Just like in Town Archery, we're going to complete this twice, once for a quiver upgrade, getting the largest quiver, and once for a heart piece. Now we're off to Great Bay to feed the fish that we got in our bottles to the fish that are in the tank in the marine lab. The goal here is to feed four fish to one of the two fish swimming around in the tank, and then have that fish eat the other fish. There is some RNG in this, and it is kind of manageable. There is a strategy here, I'll stand in a specific place on the tank and drop the fish at a specific time relative to how I see them swimming, and then just hope that the correct fish eats the fish I drop. This is a pretty unfortunate thing to lose time on when you lose time on it, because needing to go get more fish means leaving the lab entirely, going to the grotto on the Great Bay Shore, entering, getting some fish, and then soaring back here and that constitutes minutes of time loss, if including all of the extra cutscenes we have to watch of the fish eating the fish that we drop. Fortunately, I believe I do a four fish fish heart piece here. I think I only need to drop two more. And the strategy you'll see me do on this last one, it, I did this on all the cycles, is to wait for this fish to swim around the tank once, Kind of stop there, so I'm waiting for it to come back around. And while that fish is, if that fish is in motion, while I drop my fish and pretty close to me in the tank, then it has a pretty good chance of eating the fish that I drop. Not 100%, but a pretty good chance. Our next move is to Akana for some cleanup. We're going to do the Poe Sisters minigame, and we're also going to clear Secret Shrine, which is a kind of hidden area with a mini boss rush that Link is not allowed to enter until one, he has the light arrows to open the door, and two, he has a base number of hearts, which I believe is 14. Poe House is a little bit weird. For some reason, you can't transform in here, so I had to enter as human. Uh, arrows are required to beat the last phase of the Poe fight, 
So entering as Goron just means uh, a long and painful death. Much like the big Poe fight before, I am going to try to hit the next Poe on its one frame of vulnerability. Nice. And I'm awkwardly trying not to target the Poe's so that they don't disappear. Jump slashes are very powerful, so I want to do those. I want to be targeted, but not locked onto the Poe. And conveniently, light arrows are both fast for killing this last phase of the fight, and will garner us another 50 rupees, which is important for making up for some of the rupees that we withdrew from the bank after first depositing 200 back in cycle 2. This is another area of the game where we will actually get some use out of Bunnyhood, seeing as we'll need to be human jumping around the platforms in the center of Secret Shrine. You'll notice though that I take Bunnyhood off entering this door, and that's just because jumping to the first platform I jump to, um, the, the first platform is a little bit too close for Bunnyhood. If I get a Bunnyhood jump, I'll soar right over it. And here, first one is the Garrow Master fight, which again, I believe this went poorly this round. The strat with Great Fairy Sword is to get one jump slash, get hit, and then, while still invulnerable from the first hit, uh, wait for the slash from the Garrow Master, and then just jump slash him again, but obviously I missed that somehow. I'm not really sure how that fight worked out, but we got there. This is one other convenient thing about doing Secret Shrine here. We are going to have nearly full rupees by the end, and we'll be able to go straight to the bank. Next is Wart, and the only difference between this fight and the fight we did in Great Bay Temple with Wart is that we now have Great Fairy Sword, so the second phase of Wart will go a bit quicker. In the first phase, I am going to try to get the double hit with the bomb again but I don't think I get it this time. It's really hard to tell whether it works or not. Ward did make two damage sounds, but no, only got damaged once. It's kind of an awkward strat. There is actually a pretty cool strat for this. Oh no, and Wart just didn't open its eye. There's a pretty cool strat for this that involves knocking Wart down with the Great Fairy Sword without using any bombs or arrows or anything. And it's very fast, but very finicky and easy to fail. Easy to lose a lot of time on. So at this point in this segment, I'm realizing that I definitely don't have enough in-game time to make it to Grandma without inverting and causing time to go slower, so at some point in the next two mini-boss fights I'm going to do that. Ideally, if inverting here, you'd do it very near the end of the Secret Shrine, when Ocarina is already equipped, rather than doing an extra equip, but with this in-game time, I think I'm going to have to do an extra equip. Now, in the three Wizrobe fights we've had up to here in the run, I've mentioned that I try to hit the Wizrobe on its frame of vulnerability between the first phase and the second phase, but right here I'm not going to do that, and that is because on this particular Wizrobe, doing that can cause a soft lock, which of course we'd like to avoid. This Wizrobe is a pretty pesky one, because with that spawn that I just got, I believe it's impossible to hit the Wizrobe while targeting it, and it's very difficult to get a good angle on it without targeting, so I flubbed that one a bit. And here I am pulling Ocarina early, doing that extra equip. 
just to make sure that I get to grandma on time. We have, of course, saved the most exciting and explosive mini-boss fight for last. Looks like this guy won't go down without a fight. And that was the fight. Now we are here to get the heart piece from grandma, but before we do, like I mentioned before, we do need to deposit the rupees we got from Secret Shrine in the bank. And we are also going to advance the Anju Cafe quest, we're also going to bonk on that pole. Uh, as we still need to get the Anju Cafe side quest far enough this cycle that we receive the priority mail, which we will then exchange for the Chateau Romani and our sixth bottle. Here is where it's very convenient that we got the room key earlier. If we were actually going to make the cycle and make it to grandma without inverting, making time slower, then having to do the Zora gainer to get into the inn like we've done prior to this in the run could make or break the run, which would be very stressful. Counterintuitively, to get this heart piece, I need to answer, I don't know. So I'm going to do that. Listening to that story from Grandma has advanced us to day three, so we're now in the final day of the final cycle of the run. And here we're going to finally complete the three-day mini-games, Honey and Darling and Deku Playground. Interestingly, I'm going to enter Honey and Darling day three as Deku, and the reason for that is that this is the archery mini-game, and I guess the game supposes that you're going to complete the mini-game as Deku if you enter as Deku. So, if you enter as Deku, there are fewer targets on the wall than there would be if entering as any other form. I guess because it would be a lot harder to hit all of the targets with Deku bubbles than it would be with uh, arrows.
Next is a song of double time to advance to night of day three. And the reason we're doing this is so that we can get the things we need from the back of Curiosity Shop, the priority mail, so that we can get Chateau. And I'm finally going to uninvert time again to make it go faster. I really could have done this at any point after hearing the story from Grandma, but this is the last place I'll have Ocarina equipped and might as well play it safe. So put it as late as possible. This is our sixth and final bottle, meaning that our inventory screen of the pause menu is completely full now in terms of permanent items. And that just leaves a couple of heart pieces for us to get. The first is completing the third day of Deku Playground, which we will do momentarily. And the last one is the bank heart piece, which requires 5,000 rupees, which will require a little bit more rupee farming. Much like Deku Playground Day 2, Day 3 requires some parkour, and in fact, to make the cycles line up nicely, one must enter as Goron to get to this flower as quickly as possible. There's actually a small mistake here. I should have drunk the Chateau Romani as Deku, as Deku has the quickest drinking animation, but I forgot to until now, so I lost a few frames there. Anyway, we are now off to do the last of our rupee farming. As I mentioned before, it was kind of unfortunate that we had to rupee farm earlier in the run because we did not yet have infinite magic and a lot of arrows, but now we do. So this rupee farming is going to go quite a bit faster because I do not need to get RNG magic and arrow drops between now and the end of the run. This rupee farming will go even a little bit faster still, because with this infinite magic, I can get spikes on my way back to Clock Town, not having to worry about running out.
It is worth noting here, as the clock chimes 12, that unlike in first cycle where we wanted to be ready at the clock tower when the clock hit 12 to enter the Skull Kid fight as quickly as possible, it doesn't really matter here whether we enter exactly at 12, we just need to get the things done that we need to get done. And in fact, we don't want to be in South Clock Town when the clock hits 12 because the cutscene of the clock tower or doors opening will play again. So it is optimal to be out here. And with that, we finally have the bank heart piece, which is the final heart piece we get before going to the moon. Unfortunately, I made a menuing error there and talked to the banker again. So we have 19 of our 20 heart containers in the HUD in the top left corner. We will be receiving the remaining four heart pieces for completing the trials on the moon. I've mentioned that a few of the songs that we learn in this run only get a couple of uses. This one only gets one, and it's right near the end of the run, so it's not unheard of for me to forget how to play the song by the time I get here. But with that very difficult part over, we enter a very long giant's cutscene. I think this lasts for about five minutes. And we can take this time to reflect upon the run, to reflect upon our lives, to reflect upon just about anything. Or go to the bathroom.
Back to the gameplay. The object on the moon is to give all of the masks that we've acquired to the kids running around and complete the trials, one for each of the boss remains. Now there is a particular order I'm going to go in just for efficiency in my equips. I'm going to do the twin mold or human trial first, then I'm going to go to the goat trial, the adola trial, and finally the guy arc trial. We need to do these trials both because each one has a heart piece, and only through completing the trials can we obtain the Fierce Deity Mask, which is the final thing we need to 100% Majora's Mask. Here in the Twin Mold trial, the Bunny Hood will get the last of its use before we give it away. Once again, an extremely tough mini boss fight coming up here. I'm shaking in my boots. Here's our third and final Garo Master fight of the run. Again, I believe this one somehow also goes poorly. Trying to do the damage taking strat, and yet somehow my invincibility frames didn't last as long as I expected. Well, at least that was better than the other ones. Here I'm setting up my angle so that I can hookshot the chest that spawns here a little bit more easily. In the next room, something kind of strange is going to happen. I'm going to play a song in front of Gossip Stone in order to spawn a fairy, but I'm not going to intentionally collect the fairy. I don't really care about the fairy. I just need to play the song. And the reason for that is that in the following room and the room after that, we'll see me do this again. There are puzzles that must be completed in order to open the door to the next room. But it turns out that the flag the game sets when the puzzle has been completed can also be set by playing a song in front of a gossip stone in the previous room. Why the flags are shared, I couldn't tell you, but it works the same as completing the puzzle, and may even be intended, and in any case is allowed in this speedrun. Unfortunately, that was the one time in the run I wanted the chest to spawn underneath Link rather than next to him because I didn't need its contents and if the chest were to spawn underneath Link I could jump onto the ladder and make my way up a little bit more quickly but unfortunately the iron knuckle pushed me off of my uh, spot. Next is the Goat Trial, which will be completed by rolling as Goron. Admittedly, the strat for the first part of this trial blew my mind when I first learned it. It turns out that to bonk off of these chests at a perfect 90 degree angle, you just let go of the control stick. I'm currently holding A and doing nothing else.
Now I actually need to begin steering. Now here we're going to cross this little bridge to take a shortcut to the ending. And we're just going to get these pots out of the way. This is a bit of a risky roll here because if I were to hit that rainbow hexagon or portal thing in the middle of that platform, then I would have been teleported back to the beginning of the trial and that would have cost me something on the order of 45 seconds. Next is the Adola trial. This trial is somewhat interesting because it tries to force you to go somewhat slowly, but we are going to cheese it a little bit at the end. Once I get over to the back right ledge that has the heart piece on it, I'm going to very intentionally keep the camera facing away from the center of the room. And that prevents these spinny doohickeys from continuing to spin, which means that I can make a cycle that I otherwise couldn't make and land on the yellow flower, which will take me to the end of the room. Last is the Gyork trial. In this trial, we simply need to follow a set path in order to find the heart piece, so by memorizing that path, I can immediately go to it. And then casually, one would have to restart the trial in order to go find the way out, uh, finding the child that let us in. But by swimming right up in the corner of this pipe, I'm going to be able to swim past the flow, and just go out one layer so that I can go the correct direction to find the child. With the four trials complete, the only thing left to do is to talk to Majora's Mask, receive the Fierce Deity Mask, and then complete the final boss fight.
In an any percent run, this would be kind of a tough boss fight because there is a lot of potential to take damage and an any percent run would not have very much health. However, this being a 100% run, I have 20 hearts and double defense, so dying is not really a concern. And because I have Fierce Deity Mask and Infinite Magic active with Chateau Romani, I at worst can just stand here and spam B to shoot magic attacks. And I am going to do that here. One magic attack and a jump slash will take care of the first phase of Majora's Mask. And then on the second phase, I'm going to shoot two magic beams. There we go. And then try to kill as many of the masks as possible before the cutscene begins. Looks like I got one of them there. Phase two is Incarnation. And Incarnation is kind of pesky. It's very hard to predict where it will go. And if you get lucky, you can knock it down quickly, but if not, it takes a little bit. I got it pretty quickly there. And using magic in that way is a stun lock on it. Last we have Wrath, which unfortunately can stun lock Link. And that will happen to me this fight. we get to see that in action. There is a strat for killing this phase of the boss very quickly with jump slash uh, animation cancels, but unfortunately I got interrupted there by one of the masks shooting me. So here I'm going to start really feeling Majora's Wrath. I've been unable to get up or do anything for the past 10 seconds. But now the boss fight is over. And that is Majora's Mask Glitchless 100%.